I call the meeting of the San Juan Unified School District Board of Education to order. There are two closed session items on tonight's agenda. Item one is student expulsions in three cases and student enrollment in one case pursuant to Education Code Section 48918F. And item two, collective bargaining matters, discussion with negotiator Daniel Thigpen, Senior Director, Labor Relations regarding CSEA Chapter 127, General Operations Support, Chauffeurs, Teamsters, Local Number 150, Transportation, Supervisors, Teachers, and Certificated Supervisory Units, and regarding non-represented groups, Management, and Confidential Units, pursuant to Government Code Section 54957.6. We do not have any speaker comment, speaker cards on the closed session agenda items, and we do not have any written comments submitted at this time. We will now move into closed session and we'll return to open session at 6.30 p.m. I call the meeting of the San Juan Unified School District Board of Education back to order. Board meetings are being held in person in the boardroom at the district office and the public is welcome to attend. Pursuant to state and local health guidelines, masks are required to be worn indoors. Individuals attending in person are requested to keep their mask on for the duration of their time here at the meeting. Staff has been stationed outside of the boardroom to ensure that all in-person participants are aware of the mask requirements. Individuals who have removed their mask after entering the building have been asked to put their mask back on or leave, and they are refusing to follow these guidelines at this time. Alternatively, the meeting may also be viewed on the district's YouTube channel where it is being live streamed. The meeting is being audio and video recorded and the recording may capture sounds and images of those attending this meeting. The recording will be posted on the district website. At this time, I invite you to please stand for the presentation of the colors by the Casa Roble Fundamental High School Air Force Junior ROTC. Good evening and welcome. I'm Paula Viesquez, board president. And to my right is Dr. Michael McKibben, board vice president. To his right is Ms. Zima Creason, board clerk. And to her right is Ms. Pam Costa and Mr. Saul Hernandez, board members. To my left is Superintendent Kern and to his left is board administrative assistant, Stephanie Cunningham. Before we begin, I'd like to review the two methods that are available to offer a public comment for tonight's meeting. For those who have joined us here in person, I'd like to offer and would like to offer a public comment on items that are on the agenda. We ask that you please complete a speaker card that is available at the staff table over here with the table tent public comments in front of it. And you will be called on at an appropriate time during the agenda. You will be called on in sign up order. The second option is to submit a public comment online 
using the comment form located on the district website at www.sanjuan.edu slash board meeting. If you wish to submit a public comment on more than one agenda item, please submit a separate form for each item on which you are commenting. Comments received by 6 p.m. today have already been shared with all board members. Comments received after 6 p.m. tonight, including those submitted during the meeting, may be read during the meeting, depending on time restrictions. Comments may only be submitted on an agenda item up until the time that that agenda item has been discussed. Please note that all public comments are subject to a two minute limit or approximately 1500 characters. With that, we are now at item D, approval of the minutes. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Seeing none. Is there a motion to approve the minutes for a September 28th meeting? It's been moved by Ms. Creason. Is there a second? It's been seconded by Dr. McKibben. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. We are now at item E1, our high school student council report. Tonight, we have one high school student council report. Please welcome Soraya Matthews from El Camino Fundamental High School. Welcome. Oh, do you mind just pressing the button there to make sure? There we go. Oh, it's You're on. good to go. There yep. we go. Good evening, President Fiascus, members of the board, Superintendent Curran, and Ms. Cunningham. My name is Soraya Matthews, and I'm the ASB president at El Camino Fundamental High School. I'm super excited to speak on behalf of my school today there, about what's been happening here at El Camino. El Camino students have been super happy to return back to a somewhat normal school life. However, there have been a few major changes. EC has transitioned into a four by four block schedule in order to enable students to get all of their credits while still taking electives. With our new sk schedule, El Camino has introduced a variety of new electives, including a medical assistant program, sociology and new arts classes. Our senior student government class has been hard at work. They organized a COVID safe senior sunrise on our football field on August 13th. Shortly after, senior parking spots were sold and painted. They're working hard to keep senior traditions going during these difficult times. Seniors have now designed and are currently selling their senior sweatshirts. Speaking of student government, all four classes have created and sold class shirts and are been, have been working hard to organize and host as many fundraisers as they can. On September 9th, we had our annual club rush. Kids from all over the school gathered together in the quad to join clubs that, they, that have been created by other students, such as the Civics Club, the Feminist Club, and Chess Club. Club Rush has always been a great event to help kids get more involved, allow them to try new things, and give them opportunities to make new friends with similar interests as them. Other ways we have been working to get our students more involved is by having spirit days and encouraging kids to not only dress up, but to attend the games after school and to sit in our student section, the Screaming Eagles, in order to cheer on our teams. More and more students are getting involved and are enjoying the increase of school spirit and fun. We really miss the student, the student sections at games and we're happy to have the Screaming Eagles back in business. Our drama class also had a really fun Shakespeare in the Park event, having anyone who was interested to come by to have some fun reciting and acting out some Shakespeare. It was a great opportunity for students to, to, for students to try out drama and for our drama students to have some fun and interact and teach some new faces. Drama also had the pleasure of having Ashley De La Rosa from the Broadway show Hamilton come by and watch the performance to critique some of and give them some pointers. El Camino has also really prioritized helping students to feel welcomed and comfortable at our school this year. Our Link Crew has hosted freshman orientation along with our Link Crew barbecue for our freshmen. Link Crew works hard to help the freshmen feel heard and comfortable at EC. As our sophomore, sophomores never got a proper freshman introduction to our school, Due to COVID, we organized a sophomore social for kids to come by, eat some ice cream, and meet their classmates on a larger scale. As for upcoming events, student government is hard at work planning our homecoming dance. Following traditions, we have our homecoming royalty nominations and voting happening right now, along with the student government classes have been working in for months in order to build their homecoming floats. Although there are a lot of work, the classes are excited to show them off on Friday, October 29th at the homecoming game. The school is super excited to have a dance for the first time in almost two years. We are hoping to foster some school spirit with the spirit week, the week of homecoming. We are ecstatic to be able to have homecoming and all of its normal events again this year. El Camino has been doing fairly well. We are full of pride and happy to be back in school. I would love to answer any questions that the board may have. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. Thank you so much for your time.
Thank you very much, Ms. Matthews, for joining us and for your report. At this time, I'm going to see if my colleagues have any questions for you. Mr. Hernandez. Ms. Matthews, I was particularly so happy to hear about you guys having your dance. It's been a long time coming. I assume that's going to be in the quad somewhere outside. Is that correct? Yes, we're going to have it in our outdoor quad. And is the dance the same night as the floats or? They are on two separate nights. So our float is on going to be on Friday, the 29th, the same day as our homecoming game. And then the dance will be the following Saturday on the 30th. Outstanding. Thank you so much for your report. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Creason. So Soraya, I don't think you know me, but I know you and I know your younger <laughs> siblings. They went to school with my son and I love your mama, Sherry. So tell her I say hello. And I'd taken everything not to take a picture of you so I could send it to her right now. So it's always very exciting to see the young folks that I, I know. I know I know you indirectly, but I know your youngers and it's wonderful just to see you in this space and really excited to hear about all the positive things that are going on at your school. I know it's been a really hard two years-ish um, and just your spirit and optimism. And I know you've been working hard for your school community um, really shines through. So just thanks for all you do. And really, please tell your mom I said hi. I will. Thank you. Dr. McKibben. Uh, can, uh, Sherry, can you uh, say, uh, I'm sorry, Soraya, can you uh, say a little bit more about the Shakespeare in the Park? Where and when, when does, is it ongoing? Uh, um, it was an event that happened a few weeks ago. It was hosted on a Saturday. I'm not entirely quite sure where it was hosted. Um, but it was our drama. They just had a, like this big event where they wanted as many kids as possible to just come and like try out drama. And they were like teaching them monologues and different things to try out. So it was like a, just a, almost like a drama mixer for kids to just okay. try out new things. But it already happened. But they did practice a lot for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the very robust report and also just being a wonderful representative of the students and everything that's going on there at El Camino. And that did remind me, you know, I found out about um, the cast member Hamilton visit after the fact and I meant to go back and say we must adopt a rule that if the cast from Hamilton is coming to a school, there must be more information. Either way, really, my point was, I was very jealous to see that. That seemed very exciting. Were you able to participate? In that um, I did not, because I myself am not part of drama, no. and it was a little bit exclusive. Um, but <laughs> I heard that the kids who did go to meet her had a lot of fun. And I heard she gave some fantastic feedback yeah, there were, as well. Yeah, there were a lot of photos. Um, our yearbook was able to take a lot of good photos of them, and I got to see them, and they were, it just looked like it was a really good time. Yeah, what a unique opportunity. And I'm just so glad that our students got to take advantage of having an amazing performing cast in town. It, that sounded really wonderful. I wanted to invite you, but you don't have to. I don't want to put you on the spot <laughs> to expand just a little bit more on Club Rush and any um, feedback you have or anything in particular you've particularly enjoyed. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I personally love Club Rush just because I love the idea of clubs and just getting super involved in your school in very unique ways. Um, I feel it was organized super well this year, especially considering that we've had a year break from student government. So a lot of the kids in the class this year are super new and they don't know a bunch of stuff, but they're able to organize it super well. We had tons of fun clubs, a lot of new clubs and um, like looking over the lists of all the people who signed up, they were like, there was a lot, a lot of kids who were signing up for clubs, showing that the students in general just wanted to be involved. Um, in, I feel like in general, we just have like a really wide variety of clubs. So a lot more students got involved this year. Awesome. That's great to hear. Thank you very much for your report. And of course, we invite you to stay for the remainder of the meeting, but you just discussed how pretty busy you are. So this is also a good time um, to take your leave as well. Thank you for joining us this Thank evening. You. Thank you. <laughs> We are now at item E2, staff report, Superintendent Kern. Thank you, President Viasquez, members of the board, community members. Um, Want to update you on two items, one of which Soraya kind of alluded to, which is our activities. Um, we have put together uh, guidance so that individual school sites can request to have certain other activities. To date, we have plans for more than 34 events ranging from athletic competitions to student band performances, community, community meetings, and yes, dances. Events plans are reviewed by the elementary and secondary offices before being approved, with the turnaround time for most events being less than 24 hours. So 
it's good to see that we have a process. I, I do believe in terms of dances, we are one of, if not the first um, district in Sac County that's allowing those. So we're, we're excited to see that happening as well. The second piece is we've had a fair amount of questions about this um, over the last week since the announcement was made by the governor. And I'm just gonna read you an update from Dr. Casirier from the County of Sacramento. And she is our public health officer. On October 1st, 2021, the state of California announced that all students at public, charter, and private K-12 schools in California will be required to be vaccinated for COVID-19 starting the school term following the full FDA approval of the vaccine for the grade span. The new mandate will be phased in by grade span, K-6 and 712. Implementation will begin with grade 712, starting the following term full FDA approval for ages 12 and older. Current projections are for the mandate to apply to grade 712 starting on July 1st, 2022. Implementation for grades K-6 would likely occur at a later date, depending on timing of full vaccine approval for ages 5 to 12. The mandate will be a condition of in-person attendance. A student who is not vaccinated may remain enrolled in independent study, but may not attend in-person instruction. Now we'll get to the exemption piece here in a second. Staff, the governor has also directed that adults be held to at least the same standards as students. All st school staff will be required to be vaccinated no later than when the requirement takes effect for students. The current verify or test requirement for staff will be converted to a vaccine mandate no later than when the first phase of the student requirement becomes effective. And currently related to exemptions, requirements established by regulation, not legislation, must be subject to exemptions for both medical reasons and personal beliefs. It is unclear at this time if the California legislature will prefer, pursue legislation to remove the personal beliefs exemption option for COVID-19 vaccines. And Sacramento County Public Health has no plans to implement an accelerated local mandate. So that's just the, the latest official update that we have received from our public health advisor. And I wanted to be able to read that. And if we in the future get more of those that are kind of those official releases, we'll read those into the public record as well. Thank you. I'll turn it to my colleagues for any questions at this time. Mr. Hernandez. Mr. Kern, thank you so much for that report. I, I just have a question for you to the best of your knowledge. And I know what this is an ongoing changing scenario. But to the best of your understanding, what does personal belief mean? That's a really good question that I don't want to define at this point. And I think what will happen, Mr. Hernandez, is over the course of the next number of months, um, that may be more clearly defined. President Viasquez, do you know the official definition of it? I don't have anything to add at this time. Okay. Yeah, it's, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. That's one of those areas where there are lots and lots of questions. And so um, we'll be following that. Uh, I'm actually, I'll be attending a meeting with some of the large urban superintendents over the next uh, two days. So that's a question I can even raise there. My guess is they're in a very similar situation about trying to get clear understanding of that. So with the fact that we have um, this taking effect July of 22, I believe there's time for us to hopefully get real clear understanding of that. Um, and really even, you know, look at how we would staff our schools based on those, those factors that will affect enrollment for next year. I assume then if I asked you, you mentioned uh, medical and personal beliefs, but in the, on the mandate, there was a third category of religious, which was, am I not correct? Isn't that, was three medical, religious beliefs and personal. You know, what I would say is I, I, I thought I read the same originally as well. It is not right here. Mm. Um, and I'm not sure if in her response, she is just kind of commingling those two together, which I think is, is, is happening sometimes, kind of that religious or personal beliefs are. are... I, I'm almost positive that was mentioned because I, I remember reading the, the press, I mean, the press release. And I, I assume that religious beliefs also would be, we're not really sure what that means either then based on what you just said. Yeah, uh, stay tuned. As, okay. And as, when we get more information, more specific information, we'll make sure we communicate that out, not only at the board meeting, but you know, throughout our community as well. Thank you. Any other questions at this time? Ms. Creason. 
I just want to say thank you to staff for all the work that went into making events happen. It's um, I know we got a whole lot of feedback and I, I really was excited to be able to send my son to his first time coming. Um, but I also recognize that we have to stay to safe and safety had to come first and things were changing fast and to be able to put these on within the guidelines and keep everyone safe was no easy task, but our team figured it out and really, really appreciate everything that you did to make it happen. Um, and I do appreciate the vaccine update. We're getting a lot of questions about that. And I think that there's um, questions in community about what decisions we make as a school board versus what questions are, are what uh, mandates are coming from the powers that be that are outside of us. So that update, you know, making it really clear where those mandates are coming from and the exemptions and just to keep those coming would be really appreciated as we move closer to those dates so everyone's informed and has the opportunity to ask questions as we move in that direction. Yeah, we'll, we'll continue to do that. I, I will say one of the things is we, on your first item about having the events and the dances that I would, I hope our students are really thoughtful about is we've seen a recent outbreak at one of our high schools where there are a lot of students that were impacted with I think last check was at least 24 positive cases and a lot of students are now having to be quarantined because of that. So I, we, we want activities, but we also want to, to, you know, be wise in that. Um. And I appreciate you saying that. And I think it's a reminder. Um, I know it's a conversation I'm having at home and I encourage others to have at home. It's, we don't want to go backwards. <laughs> you know, we do not want to go backwards. We want to keep on moving forward and all of us have to do our part to continue going in this direction. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Creason. Um, just to, I think you covered it in your report, but I just want to um, kind of have it repeated one more time. What's the earliest that we know of now that this might go into place? Yeah, so that when I think when the governor first came out with this announcement, he, he used the term and it was here again, the first term after full approval. So I was on a, um, AXA Association, California School Administration's webinar last week, and their legislative update was addressing this issue with some of the governor's staff. And I specifically asked the question again, because they alluded to it, but I, I really wanted to take all doubt out. And, and his staff member who was there specifically said the earliest it would be would be July 1st, 2022. So, I, and that was, you know, I think it would have been really challenging for schools to try and implement this change with the staffing shortages and a, and a number of other things if that were to happen any sooner than that. Um, so we were pleased to hear that. It allows us to have ample time to really do this in a thoughtful way rather than just rushing into it. And I also um, want to thank you for mentioning the kind of the recent outbreak. Um, I, I think it's just important um, that the kind of safety plans for events are uh, done very thoughtfully and deliberately. And um, I'm glad that there's a short turnaround time so they can be implemented quickly. But I just want to make sure we don't get into a pattern of just kind of haphazardly approving things because I think they play a really critical role to keeping our staff and our students safe. And I also um, just want to say, I don't know the technical difference between the kind of personal belief exemption and the medical exemption components, but I was excited to hear the news um, that it's added to the schedule. I want to just kind of take the opportunity to remind folks that mandating vaccines for um, enrollment in schools is nothing new. So I'm glad we're taking, um, that the state has led on taking this step forward. Um, and with that, seeing no further questions or comments at this time, we are now at items E3 through E5. Um, I'm gonna double check, but I don't think we have any, one moment for me to pull up my, I don't see um, any speaker cards for board appointed or district committee employee organizations or other district committees at this time, okay. So we are now at item E6, closed session expulsion actions. I'll turn it over to board clerk Creason. The board voted unanimously to accept the hearing panel's recommendation of three suspended expulsions in case numbers S01, S04, S05, and SO5. The board also voted unanimously to accept a hearing panel's recommendation of one enrollment in case number OS09. Thank you, Ms. Creason. Next, we are at item F, visitor comments. Uh, we do have in-person requests to offer uh, visitor comment at this time. 
I'd like to remind the public that comments are limited to two minutes. The clock here on the screen will count down the time. And under the Ralph M. Brown Act, the board is not allowed to comment on items that are not on the agenda. So we are not ignoring your comments. We just can't respond to any individual comments. The superintendent can refer items to staff who can follow up with you. Um, and just quickly a reminder, this is general visitor comments for items that are not on the agenda. If you do want to speak to something on the agenda, there are also public comment opportunities for each agenda item. We will start, we'll be going in order um, uh, by those who've signed up. I apologize in advance if I mispronounce, mispronounce any names. As I call the individual who is up, I will also be calling the person next on deck so you know who is next and you can be prepared um, to, to join us after that individual is done. First, we have Luke Mallison, followed by Hillary Auer. And I, again, apologize, I might not have gotten this right. Um, Luke, please um, join us and commence your two minutes when you're ready. First time I've done this, so uh, bear with me. I made a sign. It says, ivermectin cleared my lungs in 15 hours. And my natural immunity is better than any uh, vaccine. <laughs> Thank you. That's nice of you to say it to, to applaud. Uh, but uh, I feel strongly about this. This is a personal, my personal story. And I know it's true for thousands and thousands of other people in the nation around the world. Um, I had COVID for 13 days and I couldn't breathe. My lungs were filling up, I had severe pneumonia. I ended up going to the emergency room, uh, had blood clots in my lungs. My, our friends told us about ivermectin, which is a, um, well, for the sake of time, you can look it up, you've probably heard of it already. Um, I got my um, information from COVID19criticalcare.com. Lots of information about exactly what the dose is and everything, so I got a safe dosage. Uh, make a long story sh short, um, on Friday afternoon, um, I took the medicine. Saturday morning, my lungs were totally clear and um, I could breathe again. So uh, this, is, uh, this is my story. And um, I know uh, some people might um, discount it, but I know what happened. And I, I know that it, it saved, saved, uh, saved my life. I've already got a pre-existing condition. So, um, my plan is um, I'm not gonna take a vaccine for two reasons, I already had COVID. Many people are having adverse reactions to the vaccine. If, and um, I'm gonna join a lawsuit against the district if, uh, if they won't let me keep my job. And if these don't work, then I'll just move, move out of California and find, find a work elsewhere. Thank you for your attention. Next up, we have Hillary Auer followed by Kelly Hudson. Um, and a reminder, limited to two minutes, thank you. I will invite members of the public for silent support, such as thumbs up or flags, but as long as folks stick to their two minutes, please proceed. Can you hear me? Okay, here we are. Um, I would like you as the board to consider fighting back and standing up um, should there be a, a firm vaccine mandate in place. Um, the average timeline, according to the CDC, for a vaccine to be developed is at least 10 years, the average between 10 to 15 years to be developed, tested and approved. And this is according to CDC guidelines. The COVID vaccine has not been out long enough. We don't know the long-term side effects. There's been way too much pressure. Feels like we're being controlled, even bribery. This should be a choice of families, students and their parents, not mandated or forced. At the very least, we deserve the right to have a waiver, but I. I really would ask on behalf of a lot of parents that I know that you consider fighting against this. There's just too much pressure and control and the students' um, immune systems can fight it. Thank you. Next up, we have Kelly Hudson. Um, and this is our last in-person request for public comment. So at this point, if you would like to offer public comment, please visit our public comment corner over here. Kelly, please begin when you are ready. Dress, uh, Mr. Hernandez, you asked a couple of questions and I have a couple of answers for you here. 
Uh, the state law governing vaccine requirements for students in California is found in the Health and Safety Code sections 120325 through 120338. Uh, if a parent wants to decline the COVID-19 shot for our children due to religious reasons, our child are pr protected under discrimination under Education Code 220. And they must be granted equal access to all school services, equal access, not online. The education code section 212.3, religion includes all aspects of religious belief, observance and practice, which includes agnosticism and atheism. The other thing I just wanted to address is, uh, I want you to just understand that we know that we're talking about different things. So we're never gonna be happy. When you say the word safety, safety to us would be living in a state where our governor, our health department allows our doctors to early treat our children and ourselves. That is being blocked. It's not being allowed. That is what's being, that is what needs to be done. When 24 kids break out and get sick, guess what? Kids get sick. We all get sick. This is a very serious virus for a certain demographic. There are plenty of people on this planet that know exactly what to do to stop it. And it is not being allowed. You all think you're safe Thank and you're you. not. That's the balance of your two minutes. Next up, we will move to written comments and I'll invite Ms. Rye to navigate us through our written comments at this time. Of course, the Thank first you. is from Rachel who writes, Dear Board, as a community, we are adapting and learning to live in a new normal with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. I know that the district has aligned safety standards with those of Sacramento County Public Health and California Department of Public Health. That is a wise decision, but my concern is that those safety standards are not consistent throughout the district. I do see steps have been made to clarify safety standards, but unfortunately enforcement is still a problem. Some administrators are public health advocates and some are not. As a community, safety should be our primary focus. We have to remain vigilant because COVID-19 has not been eradicated. We can only move forward if everyone does their part, not just some of us. I want to commend you on cautiously postponing homecoming as these events are high risk and promoting opportunity for viral exposures. Cold and flu season arc are approaching and there is a heightened risk of infection during these seasons. We have to enforce safety as was stated by the CDC in the morbidity and mortality weekly report. Quote, universal masking is an important component in the recommended layer preve layered prevention strategy for schools and this study continues to demonstrate that face masks, when used as part of the larger strategy, can reduce spread of COVID-19 and prevent outbreaks in schools, end quote, CDC 2021. Masks and vaccines are essential to preventing infection, and wearing PPE correctly is critical to maintaining in-person learning. Thank you for your time, and stay safe, San Juan. Our next comment is from Veronica Guzman, who writes, my son, who is now a junior, and daughter, who is now a sophomore, tragically lost their father approximately 10 months before the lockdown happened. Being locked down during an important time where they needed their friends, teachers, and classmates was really hard on them. Their once great grades became failing, when, which added more stress on their fragile mental health. Now being back at school has helped somewhat, but to have it threatened with the vaccine mandate is putting them in a dark place again. The district and board need to take into consideration our children and their mental health. Not everyone is on board with the proposed vaccine mandate. To be silent about it and not discuss the severity of the negative effects it will have on children who have made the choice after researching to not get it is doing a disservice to this community. Everyone wants to support freedom of choice when it comes to abortion, but not vaccines. Make this make sense. Do not strip my children of the last couple of years of their high school experience over a vaccine mandate. Also, please be open about the amount of suicides in the district since September 2020. 
the lockdown, the mandates, the, the restriction, and let us not forget the amount of bullying that goes on. Do better for our children. They are relying on you. Our next comment is from Daniela F. I'm writing here today to discuss a protest at Casa Roble High School and Louis Pasteur Middle School that students are planning to have on Monday regarding the mandated vaccination for students attending schools, as well as simply not even wearing masks. I have seen on social media and heard throughout the halls that on Monday of next week, students are planning to walk out of school or simply not show up on their or simply not show up to their disapproval of a required vaccination or wearing their mask. I come from a high risk family and I'm scared simply showing up for school. I'm also writing as a concerned student with the rapid outbreak of COVID at Casa Roble High School. Within this past week, multiple students have tested positive or been exposed to people who have recently detected COVID. Even with this, re even with this recent outbreak, students still don't wear their masks correctly and perform little to no social distancing. How am I supposed to trust that I am safe at my school when there's multiple students getting sick and students protesting against wearing their masks and vaccinations? There are still multiple teachers who don't tell their students to wear their masks correctly. One teacher is Mr. Desmond at Casa Roble High School. He doesn't tell the students to pull their masks over their nose, even though multiple emails have been sent to the teachers. Please help us, please help us students and our community solve these issues. Next, we have a comment from Karen Vallon, who writes, Rio Americano has been following all the rules provided by the county and the district. We respectfully request that, I'm sorry, I'm gonna restart this one. Rio Americano has been following all the rules provided by the county and the district. We respectfully request that the board meet and discuss today approval of our dance for homecoming. These kids needed two weeks to plan and the approval needs to happen immediately. They have sacrificed so much and have followed every single rule that you've given them. This presents an undue burden and undue stress on their mental health as they can meet at football games with no rules but have been unable to get a green light for a homecoming dance. Can you please give that today? And our last written comment for general comment is from Melissa Pruitt, who writes, hello board members. Wish I could be there in person to deliver this message myself, but unfortunately I do not feel safe to do so given the number of parents who attend meetings without masks. That being said, for this week's meeting, I want to su submit some of my concerns. First and foremost, I have heard rumors of an anti-vax walkout this upcoming Monday. I think that everyone is entitled to their opinion, but these actions speak volumes about why we are not able to resume normal activities inside or outside of our schools. I feel that this is caused mainly due to the spread of misinformation. I have heard some people's concerns about the requiring vaccine, about the vaccine, and some are valid, but some are bordering on plain hearsay. If we are now requiring vaccines, which I completely support, we need to address concerns and help them understand what is fact and what is fiction. Another concern is the number of exposures that have been occurring. It is because of this that I feel that postponing homecoming was a very wise decision, and I think it should be canceled indefinitely. Yes, this can be a very important event, but it really does not seem safe. We can't rely that students will follow social dis distancing when they fail to do so now. Thank you for making these hard decisions and helping keep students safe even though it may be hard for the student body to see the bigger picture. Thank you, that is our comments. final written comment. Thank you very much, Ms. Rye. We are now at item <clears throat> G, the consent calendar. We do not have any, I'm double checking, but we do not have any speaker cards or written comments on this item. Do any board members wish to remove any items from the consent calendar? Okay, seeing none. Is there a motion to approve items G1 through G5? It's been moved by Ms. Costa. Is there a second? Seconded by Ms. Creason. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. We are now at our first business item for the evening. I won our K-8 schools update. 
Ms. Townsend Snyder, please begin when you are ready. Thirty seconds or less. No worries. Do you want to go straight to the PowerPoint? Yes, they're working on it. What's the benefit of being first? Thank you. Good evening, Board President Viasquez, members of the board, Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. Tonight, we're here to share with you an update on our K-8 schools while at the same time um, taking a look at their beginning years. Joining me tonight is Cassie Bennett, who supports our K-8 schools and did a lot of work in gathering feedback and putting this presentation together for you this evening. Mm -hmm. Over the course of preparing this presentation for you, we dug back into board minutes and into school documents to learn a little more about the system that we all work in now, but didn't have seats that we sit in currently today. So it was a lot of fun. <laughs> we have some action steps in our next steps moving forward and some noticings that came out to us as we did a little bit more research. Next slide. So we did a little bit of a historical dig and in reviewing information from, from previous year's board meetings, the first K-8 school was started at Orangevale Open in 1994. And through, that was through a community effort to imagine the ideal school with an open philosophy. And at that time, they were the only school of that kind within the San Juan Unified School District. It's actually written in the Orangevale Open site-based document guidelines today that referencing that period of time, it, could, it took a great deal of community effort to build their program. It was not an easy thing for them. More K-8 schools started to join that K-8 model in the 2006-2007 school year, where at the time the district was looked at regionally and the intention then was for each region to include a K-8 school. During the 2006-2007 school year, um, time frame actually, Star King was both an elementary school and a traditional middle school on the same campus, but each with their own administrative teams. So Star King during the 2006-07 school year began that move to become a K-8 school and bring those two programs together as one. In later years, more, more schools were expanded to the K-8 school model, um, including Woodside and Kingswood. When Edison became a dual language institute in 2013, as you see there, the decision was made to add grades six, seven, and eight, but through a phased in approach, one grade level at a time. We also learned through our presentation of um, this KA work that there was a task force that was started and community meetings were actually held for the communities that were interested in the time um, to become a K-8 school. A big part of the conversations that took place during that time was that these K-8 schools would be different. Um, and at the time, there was conversation that they wouldn't have locker rooms, for example, but they would provide a different kind of environment that was more intimate for those students who decided that they wanted to stay. Next slide. So in addition to digging into the board meeting documents um, from what we could find, we also dug into research and what the board was looking at at that time and what the current research says now. Um, and it's all very similar over the time period. Um, the research around K-8 school models indicates that there may be some academic benefits to students who attend K-8 schools um, and that students who attend traditional 6-8 schools sometimes see that trend of a dip in academics right about that sixth grade year where it's not always seen, it's not always seen in that same way for our K-8 schools. There are also social emotional benefits when looking at discipline and attendance. Um, specifically, research did show that there's reduced disciplinary action 
and reduced attendance concern at K-8 schools. And it was reported that students at K-8 schools more frequently self-reported feeling confident at school than their middle school peers. We learned that K-8 models may be more beneficial for students who really need more structure and stability as well. While the research does show a lot of positive impacts, it also shows that these impacts may not be long lasting, meaning they could be seen in sixth through eighth grade, but not necessarily in ninth. Next slide. So as our district is unique, our K-8 schools are also very unique. Um, in the upcoming slides, we're gonna explore some of the benefits and challenges for the K-8 communities that we learned of. And there will definitely be commonalities that you see across the schools. However, you will also see that each school, each K-8 school is unique in the programs that they offer. So the class offerings and experiences for students really do de differ depending on the school. Next slide. So as you can see on this slide at a glance, you probably look at it and can see that it's, it looks really similar. Everything is, is very straightforward on the surface across the board. So we wanted to take you on a deeper dive into each of the school's course offerings. So I want to draw your attention to attachment B. And on attachment B in your packet, you will see um, the current course offerings at each site in detail. And we really zoomed in on those electives and math courses because that is where you see their uniqueness really show up. So the elective offerings at the K-8 schools largely depend on teacher credentials and enrollment. So the more students enrolled, the more courses that can be offered, again, the more diversity and credentialing that's available. Additional elective offerings are also geared towards student need at each of those school sites. So as you're looking at attachment B, you're going to see elective wheel. An elective wheel is simply a series of electives that's offered throughout the school year that students rotate through and it's often a rotation at the trimester or semester. And as you can also see, the elective wheel at each of the school sites is very different. And that is the result of the differing credentials that the teachers bring with them that work at each of those sites. Some schools offer year-long electives and some offer classes such as English language development offered to our English learners and directed studies for our students with IEPs where it's called for in their IEP specifically. You will also notice a big difference in the math offerings at each school site. Gold River, Orangevale Open, and Sierra Oaks, for example, all offer accelerated math and integrated math, also known as IM1, which is a math class required for high school graduation, and eighth grade kids can take it if they have advanced test scores and teacher recommendations. So this is one of the areas that we're going to zoom in on later in the presentation because we really want to ensure that we're able to offer access to these accelerated math courses for all of our kids at our K-8 schools who want to take those classes. So from here, I wanna pass the presentation to Cassie. She's gonna take you through enrollment trends and some of the feedback that we gathered and heard as we went along this little journey together. Next slide, please. Thank you, Amberly, and good evening, President Viasquez and members of the board. Um, as you can see, our K-8 communities have experienced fluctuations in enrollment that are similar to that of other schools in the same regions. So the enrollment numbers shown from 2018 to 2021 are based on enrollment reported during the same time period in the fall. Some schools experience growth in enrollment across the year, and some may lose a few students. So this is just a snapshot in time. Some of our East End schools are down in enrollment, which is true for other schools in those areas, while Star King's enrollment continues to grow along with the other schools in the West End of our district. Orangeville Open is the only non-boundary school out of all of the K-8 schools. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to attachment C, which includes trends for the fifth through eighth grades over these same four years. So if you follow a school site's fifth grade enrollment in 2018-19 to their eighth grade enrollment in 2021-22, 
it will give you an idea of how many students are gained or lost from that fifth grade class across those four years. For example, Woodside had 66 students in their fifth grade class in 2018-19. And then that same class of students in eighth grade was down to 45. Next slide. So we were able to engage our educational partners at our K-8 schools, including staff, students, and families. Um, the groups had various opportunities to provide input. Initially, listening sessions were held in person with staff, students, and parents in small groups, and via Zoom with larger groups of staff and parents at both title and non-title sites. We wanted to provide additional opportunities to capture voices that may be missing, so anonymous digital surveys were posted to all the K-8 websites, distributed to K-8 staff and parents, and paper copies were made available to parents. I also asked the schools to provide translation services to any families who wanted to participate and um, needed a different language. Because the digital and paper surveys were anonymous, we were not able to determine which schools had higher completion rates. In total, we were able to capture the voices of over 100 students, more than 100 staff members, and approximately 50 family members. Some examples of the questions that were asked are shown on the slide. Next slide. The themes captured from the listening sessions and surveys are shown on the following slides, starting with the benefits of K-8 schools. So the most consistent themes are listed as they rank from highest to lowest. It was clear across all three partner groups that the sense of community was the most important benefit to all the groups. For, for parents, the sense of community almost seemed to add a layer of safety. They felt the relationships at the K-8 schools were strong, and so their kids were in a safe environment because they knew the teachers for so long, and they had friends that they had known for so long, and they knew all of the other parents. The teachers also talked about how important the sense of community is and how much they value the opportunity to collaborate with the entire staff, not just a specific department. And they also said they can support students right away with their academic needs since they know the students so well. Even the students talked about the community of inclusivity and how important that is to them. They lit up when they talked about their little buddies in the primary grades. Next slide. As we move to look at the challenges, you might notice that some of the benefits of K-8 schools can also be challenges, so kind of a double-edged sword. For example, while a benefit mentioned by parents was the ability to keep a close eye on their kids, they also said they didn't want to hear every little thing that their kid did wrong. When it came to minor behavior incidents, they felt like that was very elementary. Um, all the education partner groups felt that it was problematic that K-8 schools are geared more toward elementary and that problem impacted the different groups differently. So the staff really felt like there were some resource inequities. An example shared was that when an additional staff member is added at the 6-8 level, they may have more impact on the middle school students than when an additional staff member is added at a K-8. Um, for families, they really wanted their kids to have access to more of the middle school experiences like the electives, clubs, sports, and facilities for locker rooms was a big deal at every school that I went to. Um, the, the kids didn't like doing PE in their school clothes. Um, student responses varied in terms of the academic and social emotional challenges. One group shared that while it is fun to have a little buddy, the role modeling ends up being additional pressure that they feel. Um, one shared that if they have a peer they don't get along with, they're kind of stuck with them all the way through eighth grade and they don't have the opportunity to expand the friend group. And another shared that it was challenging to come in as the new kid during the middle school years and not having the benefit of knowing their peers and teachers since kindergarten. Next slide. So there were lessons learned from the listening sessions that fell into some larger categories. The first was the sense of community. It was clear that that was the most impactful benefit from all of the groups um, that is experienced at K-8 schools. Another category was the trend around population and stability. So earlier, Amberly shared that the research indicated that students who need more stability may benefit from a K-8 model, but we found this benefit may not be available to the students who really need it. So students who tended to be at K-8 schools for the duration of their experience had access to utilize school choice, they had transportation, and they experienced stability at the school. However, students who came to K-8 later on typically came due to life circumstances, not necessarily due to choice. Also, some of the students who attended our K-8 schools did so due to siblings, 
their proximity to home, lack of transportation, not necessarily for the increased stability that um, the K-8 offered. Next slide. The perception about K-8 schools preparing for students for high school was mixed. So more than one parent I spoke with shared that their older students had a very easy transition to high school and felt very prepared as they moved on from the K-8 setting. Some of the teachers, however, did worry that their students may not be prepared for the larger environment and additional class transitions. All the groups shared a perception that resources and choices for students in K-8 schools are not the same as what is available at traditional middle schools. Some of the exa examples we've talked about include courses, locker rooms, electives, clubs, sports, and food offerings, which was very important to the students. <laughs> um, now I'll hand it back to Amber Lee to talk about what shapes our system. Next slide. So in our lessons learned, and this slide probably looks familiar to you, you've seen it in another presentation. Um, we just wanted to call out that we recognize that the K-8 schools are shaped in the same way as our system is shaped, which means we also are, um, we have some constraints as a result. So with that, um, you saw some of what shapes the system show up within the elective offerings, um, the differences at each of the school sites. You also show, saw some of that show up within the math courses offered. Um, you saw some of the factors show up in the challenges as expressed by staff, students, and community. Um, so the elementary system, sitting with all of these schools, we have the one TK-8, which is Thomas Edison, and seven K-8s um, that exist and fall, out, fall within um, each of these components shaping our system. What's important is that we heard the voice and we see the choice that families um, are making and we know that within that choice, they also want options. And so that's what you're hearing come out in the lessons learned and also in some of the challenges that we face and, and also in some of the benefits of the K-8 schools. Um, so these are just some of the complexities, some of the complexities that exist for a K-8 school. Um, what we really appreciated was the candor of the families sharing with us and the staff sharing with us and even the kids sharing with us and where those differences were between those three groups. Um, it was a lot of work, but a lot of fun. So I want to pass this to Cassie to share with you um, what our next steps are. So while we have these confines that we work within within our system, we also have some definite actionable next steps that we want you to hear about. So as part of continuous improvement, and as we consider what we learned about our K-8 schools in terms of their unique needs, we uncovered some initial entry points where we could take action to be responsive to what we learned. For example, through conversation with the students, we found out that it would be really important to them if we could connect um, with nutrition services and see if we can do anything to offer more food options to the middle school students at K-8. Um, we also could work with K-8 schools to think about creative ways to add activities that feel more like they're geared toward middle school students. The school staff was very grateful that we were taking the time to learn about their unique needs, which is something we can continue to do, both listening to staff and families through these listening sessions. We can also use what we learned to support the K-8s in publicizing to families about the unique programs at their schools as well as what K-8 schools can offer and what they really just realistically cannot. Also importantly, we wanna look at how we might expand access to higher level math classes to our K-8 students at all the schools. We now pass this back to President Viasquez and the board for any questions that you might have of us. President Viasquez, before we start, just one more point of context for the board. You, you know, our last board meeting, we gave an enrollment update and we're trying to piece some of these things together. Even as a, at the next board meeting, we have a board workshop on open enrollment, um, which dramatically is impacted through by our K-8s. When you see the numbers at say Woodside where students are there at a certain grade in fifth grade, but then they choose to go elsewhere. Um, we're gonna be talking about start times and then later on down the road, other issues. So this is just all kind of interwoven that may affect decisions that we make down the road. So that just wanted to shape that for context. Thank you, Superintendent Kern, and thank you to staff for the presentation. I'm now gonna turn it to my colleagues for any, ex first I wanna double check and see if we have any speaker cards or written comments on this item. 
Okay, there's no public comment, so I will move it to my colleagues for any questions or comments. Mr. Hernandez. Yeah, essentially it would be yes, and it would it it all plays into the master schedule too, right? Because these folks are teaching ELA, math, and all of the other um, components too. I will say that. There are a few principles. I, I used to be a VP at a K-8 where we took on an elective and taught ourselves too. And so you do see that happen, happening sometimes as well. But with regards to Spanish and foreign language, et cetera, yeah, they, they could go on the look for that. Certainly, they would also have to take into account the other credential needed in that slot. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. It was You're pretty eye-opening. Very well done, though. Thank you. Thank Board you. Member Hernandez, I think one of the things, and and... I think it's an area where we're gonna to have to address the math need as well, is what we've learned from the last two years around a distance learning component to it. Could we offer an elective at one school where there may only be six students who would want that, but over the course of the rest of the K-8s, could we fill those virtually? Now the challenge is you don't have an extra period just sitting out there at your K-8. So the, we, we would probably have to provide some extra staffing over a period of almost like we did with the um, additional advanced placement classes, try something like that over a period of two or three years. If it was to be able to work within the system, we could try and move that forward. I think that's where we're, we're looking at, at going as well to try and be creative. Ms. Costa. Thank you for a really comprehensive report. And having lived through this as a staff member and gone to all of the meetings, I was struck with the slide about the benefits. And when I attended the meetings back in 2015, the parent, those were the dreams of the parents at that time. And we're hearing that it actually came to fruition. So that was really positive. One of the things I'd like to note is that we were really clear when we offered K-8 schools as a district that they were not middle schools. So they would not have science labs, they wouldn't have gyms, they wouldn't have locker rooms. We made that abundantly clear at the time, but I'm thinking that it's been 15 years and I don't know how often we reinforced K-8 schools are not middle school. So the kids that entered at that point in time and the families that entered at that point in time really knew that that was part of what they were agreeing to. So we need to reinforce that, I think, even more with our families. I was really glad to hear what you said, Kent, about electives and possibility for doing additional staffing because I can't imagine that the students at the other schools that don't have accelerated math don't need that. And there aren't students who would benefit from that. So that makes me really happy. And the idea that there the other electives, I think would be a real benefit if there's a way that staff can make that come together. But again, thank you for a very comprehensive report. Can I speak to something that's gonna filter into next meeting when we talk about start times as well. Think about K-8 schools and they have all different start times. So I'm a teacher and I wanna teach an elective that starts at, let's just say nine o'clock. Well, but I'm going to another K-8 and my second period doesn't start till 9.15 or 9.20 or, those are things when we try and get creative and come up with solutions like this, don't allow us to do that because we don't have a lot of uniformity when we look at the start times of our schools, they're just all over the place. So we wanna build that into our conversation as well. 
and I and I think there are a couple of creative ways we could even you know try and look at that over the couple or over the next few years. But those decisions could impact what we could even offer if there's not alignment in schedules. Ms. Creason. So I applaud you for a really great presentation. Like so much of what was built into here is what I've heard from families over the last three years, like everything, all the points, you know, about the challenges, the benefits, things people are looking for, things that, you know, yeah. So I think it's great. And I absolutely agree with what Ms. Costa said. I think a lot of the history has been lost from inception to where we're at now. That locker room thing really does come up quite a bit, yeah. <laughs> a lot, a lot. Um, so just, I applaud you on such a wonderful presentation. Just a couple of thoughts. Um, looking at slide seven, and we don't need to go back to it, but it just talks about the listening circles and we hit very specific, you know, groups that exist, but which I think is incredibly important, but I am really impressed by the effort to ensure that everybody in that space had an opportunity to provide feedback, not just the people that are already showing up, but everybody was engaged to provide feedback in one way or another. And I know that that's not easy to do. It takes more time. It's hard. Um, but I, I think it's really important that we take that time because then we hear from people that can't go, you know, and participate at the level of, you know, the groups that are regularly engaged. So just thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, I do have, and I'm sorry if you said it and I missed it and don't even need an answer today, but I'm just kind of curious about perception versus actual outcomes. You know, it's like, okay, there's this perception that we're either better prepared or not prepared, better prepared, not prepared for high school. What is that actually shaking out as at the end of ninth grade? I'm curious about, not to say I need that answer now, but just something that I wonder. Um, so I do, that leads to a question. So when we get these, um, this feedback on the perception, we surveyed, you surveyed folks that were still in the K through eight system, not folks that have graduated out of it yet, right? So um, some of that particular feedback actually came from two places. One was parents who had students who were older siblings. So they went through K-8. One was a parent who went through K-8 who had a sibling who did not go through K-8. Oh, that's and interesting. Then one, a couple were parents who had older kids that were already in high school and they were sharing with me stories about things that their high school teachers had shared with them. Like your students came very prepared. They, you know, um, so some of that was anecdotal storytelling. And, and the other piece was when I was talking to some of the teachers at the K-8 schools, they were sharing with me comments um, from collegial conversations that they had had with high school colleagues about, you know, whether the kids are ready for the big change, the big campus compared to, because the KA environment is pretty small. Right. So that's where most of that came from. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Um, and then I just wonder, and again, not an answer for today, what this looks like if we separate the school sites, because they're just all so very different mm -hmm. and very diverse community uh, areas of our very, very, very large districts. So I just wonder if the feedback is I just wonder what the feedback would be yeah. when we look at it, you know, broken down. I want to say to this, and thank you again, it was wonderful. I really, really appreciated it. Um, and I want to say to the superintendent, I really appreciate, appreciate the piecemeal approach to giving us this info, because it is a lot, and I understand we're leading up to something else, you know, some more conversations and deeper dives, and the approach that you're taking to give it to us in little pieces, at least for me, is really helpful, so I can dive down and absorb it, because it's so nuanced. There's so much to it. Um, if we got it all at one time or in just a couple of meetings, I don't think that we could, well, I don't think I could be as thoughtful with just thinking it out, <laughs> you know, as we consider what's to come. I appreciate that. You know, one of the things that they alluded to is if you live in a neighborhood where a K-8 school is, you're probably making that choice early on, mm -hmm. but you don't know for sure whether or not where your kids are going to be, what their interests are going to be. And you may need to make a decision later on um, about, you know, I want my student to go here mm -hmm. for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. We've gone back and forth over the years. The last time we actually made boundary adjustments, we, they used to have like, you could either be either or, and then we went to just straight K-8 boundaries. I, I think as we come back to that, we need to have those conversations because there may be students even in um, a local, and we could try and look into this as well, that went somewhere in K-5 and their parents said, you know, we're gonna move them over to the, to the K-8 for six, seven, and eight because it's a smaller environment because of what it provides. So 
there's there's a lot a lot to this and and what i really hope we do with all of these discussions and decisions is because we're kind of trying to undo some decisions related to certain that we did before any of us were in these positions that the decisions we're making now, 20, 30, 40 years from now, people can say those were smart decisions. So mm -hmm. taking our time and really being thoughtful about it. And things change in 20, 30 years. I'm glad we're taking the time to unpack it. And I appreciate what you said about, you know, sometimes decisions are made intentionally. And then I appreciate what came out of the presentation too. Some of it isn't intentional. It's you just ended up in that neighborhood for whatever reason, you go to the closest school or that you just don't know. I mean, it, even in my own case, I sent my kid to a school, not even realizing that there was K through sixes and K through fives. And he just happened to go there because I thought it was a good school. And then I learned along the way. So there's just so many reasons, you know? So I like that we're picking apart the different reasons because um, there isn't, you know, one box doesn't fit all. So I appreciate the approach. And I just want to say too, what my colleagues brought up um, about the staffing issues. That's something that has come up so much um, when my school site visits this year. I mean, it come, it's come up before, but a lot this year. Um, you know, kids want art classes. They want different things that they just can't access. Um, photography has come up and just can't find the staff to do it. And we can't offer every single thing at every single school. It's just never going to happen. So I appreciate the idea of thinking outside of the boss box so we can provide, you know, more enriched, whatever it looks like, more access to these things in whatever way we can, um, because times have changed. And, you know, even if we throw, I know I've heard a lot in emails, um, pay them more. You know, I wish I could pay everyone a whole lot more. Don't get me wrong. But it's not just a money issue. I mean, we have some significant bonuses and we just cannot recruit because the people aren't there for a variety of reasons. And that's not unique to our district at all or our state <laughs> um, or our county. So um, I just appreciate that we're looking into how else we can provide access to our kids. So thank you. It was a really great report. Thank you. Dr. McKibben. Uh, thank you for this walk down memory lane. Uh, <laughs> that uh, as you know, my, my son uh, joined uh, Orangeville Open when he was in third grade and stayed through eight. Um, are there any other of the K-8s that were parent slash teacher initiated schools or, or what, do you know the genesis of, of any of the other, uh, other K-8s? From what I read in the old board packets, <laughs> um, <laughs> Orangeville Open was the only one that started with parent and community effort. Um, the rest kind of came along through um, different ideas with leadership and some of the research showing some of the benefits. And I think the desire to offer different choices to different families. Um, and then of course, Edison was a whole different situation with the dual language. They wanted to be able to expand that into eighth grade. So um, each phase had a little, a little and a different backing behind it. Yeah. Dr. McKibben, I can speak a little bit to that because I was actually the director overseeing middle schools and K-8s as we expanded. And Sierra Oaks, and I, I think there was one or two others, really there was a high interest from the parents mm -hmm. and that's kind of how it started. And that's that's where the mm -hmm. conversation was and, and Ms. Costa was around at the time, clearly having those conversations with folks about what they weren't. It's like, okay, if we're gonna go in this direction, these are the things we're not gonna be able to provide. So, you know, there were probably a couple others. I, I, they did allude to the fact that um, years ago, I think when uh, Mr. Enoch was the superintendent, that it was, we wanted one in every region. And then from there, we had a little bit of growth as well. Okay. Um, did, and, and this was new to me, I didn't know, know this, um, that did, besides uh, 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 Edison, were there any that started as a K-5 or a K-6 and then added uh, six, seven, and eight, or did they all begin as six through eight schools? I, I think that's what we did on each of them. We expanded grade by grade as, so when Sierra Oaks became a K-8, it went from a K-6, Gold River the same, K-7, then K-8. Okay. Because okay. you really couldn't populate that additional grade. And, and that was true for Orangeville Open too? That they... uh, That's, uh, I don't know. Orangeville Open, you know what? It didn't say in their contract, actually. Cause... Because I don't know the answer, and I ought yeah. to know, you know, but I don't. I would imagine that it did, but I would go back. Started as a K-8, okay. The second, and this is another thing I ought to know that I don't. What is the credential needed to teach in the seventh and eighth grade of a K through eight? Six 
It depends, yeah. So some of, if you, um, as you dig in, and you can add to this too, as you dig in, what you find is that some of the school sites actually have teachers with single subject credentials. So math right. or science, right? Or some, supplementaries? Yeah, or okay. supplementaries. And some of, and a lot of them have their multiple subject credential, which allows them to teach those core classes. But if they have a multiple subject credential, do they need to get a supplementary to teach seven and eight? Is is basically the, depending on what they teach possibly yeah. okay, so if, okay if they taught math would they have to have a supplementary not if they have their multiple subject not if they have the multiple subject okay so you find a mix so at sites it's it's actually really interesting okay um that's a great question the in terms of I, i'm going to ask the credential in terms <laughs> of when you're on wheel also i didn't think you needed, for example, those those that are teaching world languages on wheel. I didn't think they needed the the credential or even the supplementary to do that. Am I? Yeah. Do you know the answer to that? Because I'm. My understanding is that they do. Yes, we actually had a conversation yeah. with HR about this. Okay, that we they do need the supplementary well. to teach, even if it's uh, even if it's a six week wheel uh, activity or something like yeah. that. Yeah, and that's. Okay, it, I did not know that. Yeah. Um, let's see, are there, are there any of the K-8s that are at capacity or are, do any of them have a wait list or are at capacity? Yeah. Um, I know Orangevale oh, Open has a wait list. Um, we might have a wait list. I, they probably have a wait list at Sierra Oaks in the, in the lower grades. So there may be some that have them in the lower grades. I think Gold uh, River still has some. Yeah. In the lower list. grades as well. Okay. Let me see. I'm just, excuse me. Think. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for, for the presentation and helping us kind of piece things together. If you look at slide 12, which you don't have to pull back up, but it's just the slide that clearly distinguishes the various numbers of variety that we have at San Juan. Uh -huh. um, it, it begs the question, how did we get here? And most importantly, where do we go next to best meet the needs of our students? And so um, I know we've kind of talked about piecing together data to inform future decisions, but I want to make sure all of our school sites know or don't run out tomorrow and get super nervous. Like we're not going to break out a secret strategy for anything, <laughs> at least not that I know of. Um, but it really is just um, a intentional examination of kind of where we are now and what, if any changes we should make. And again, it ties into kind of the enrollment conversation that we had last week and our continued conversation around open enrollment and um, how that serves our community. So I just appreciate, um, I do appreciate the, the presentation. And I think one thing that I just want to note, so when studying attachment C, You'll, you know, I did kind of take a close look because I'm curious, where do you find the most kind of enrollment fluctuations? And it seems like Thomas Edison has the biggest jump, uh -huh. right, from moving from the fifth grade to the middle, yes. middle years, yes. um, which um, I don't know if it's that particularly surprising, but given that, you know, it was built as a curriculum, or at least I think intended as a curriculum that would continue all the way through eighth grade and our students aren't matriculating all the way through. Um, what story is to be told here? And more importantly, how do we keep families there? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Let me jump in a little bit from our experience and years in working with this. I think that's one of those situations where those students that are also learning that second language are, are looking for some of those advanced courseworks and, and at, with the small numbers. So whether it's even, we're seeing a lot of those kids choose to go to IB in middle school. Mm -hmm. So we could probably even try and break down exactly where that is. So they've, they've kind of identified a specialized program for a number of years, and then they're going to another specialized program. So, um, or it might even be the demands of, it could be Arden and what they have to offer with Science Olympiad and some of those other things. So we could, we could probably even try and get some information for the board as to where those students are going. In the next couple of weeks, you guys are gonna see scattergrams from all kinds of schools, um, but that's an enrollment piece we could try and dig into a little more. Well, and I just wanna make sure to, you know, the foundation of my curiosity is making sure that we're serving our parents and our families, you know, 
I'm not saying they should be making any particular choice. And if they're making a deliberate choice one way or the other, fantastic. But I think it does tie a little bit to some of the comments from my colleagues around, you know, kind of the spread of offering and how it's not uniform across the board, right? And perhaps if some of the advanced math, et cetera, was there, maybe we'd be retaining some of those families. And so um, I don't want to make assumptions about what people should or should not do, but I want to make sure that at every site we are meeting the needs um, of our families. And it does um, kind of bring my attention right to attachment B. Now it's a it's a very kind of artificial observation, but you do see it, you know, the list of offerings in terms of the elective course kind of get a little bit smaller. The column goes a little bit smaller with each round. Now, this is just words on the paper. Like this is not a good, a, a completely accurate demonstration, right, of what happens every day. But it is a noticeable trend. Um, it seems as if some of our more established K-8s, because they were established with some very deliberate intention, have more services to offer. And I would love to see as kind of as we evolve to have that balanced out a little bit. Um, I want to just echo. I mean, again. Um, I love the uniqueness, the slides uh, that cover both the benefits and, and the challenges. And I just think there's an opportunity to um, do some kind of community education as was already um, also touched on, but I'll just add my concurrence to, I don't, I think a lot of our families end up at a school just to end up at a school. And when we're offering such a wide variety of programs and curriculums, um, it would be great if that was done with a little bit more intention through them knowing what we offer. Um, I think that's the end of my comments. Um, Dr. McKibben has one more question. Question, I would just want to add to that notion of marketing. When we were looking at, at schools, and you have to understand that these kinds of uh, decisions are made by my wife because her husband doesn't know anything about education. <laughs> So I understand that this was uh, basically talk. But I think that when we were looking for things, one of our problems was we couldn't find out much. And, and the marketing issue that, that you're talking about and trying to find out where the information uh, was available, it certainly is better now at San Juan Central than it was then. But, uh, but that whole notion is that trying to the only place that we could find out things was to talk to other parents. And we didn't know very many parents that were going to that school. So, so the idea of, of having some kind of marketing, I don't care if it's brochures or that sort of thing, that tells not only about, about the K through eights, but all of our schools and the features and the missions and things like that, I think would be a greatly thing. I, I remember the, the thing that one of the things that attracted me about Orangeville open that may be at other things was because the seventh and eighth graders all, all had a buddy in a, in a younger class. And my son still talks to that buddy. What is that, 15 years later? Uh, and, and so forth. So, and, and I also ag agree with you on the, the nutritional options and, and those kinds of things are things that could be made better. And, and it clearly is better now than it was then. But uh, there's, there's some work to be done there too. But uh, uh, yeah, we need to, we've got some great things going on and, and I'm not sure everybody knows about it. Seeing no further questions or comments at this time, thank you both very much for this report. It is a report, there's no action item. So that's the completion of the business item. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. We are now at item I2, our ESSER 3 expenditure plan. Ms. Bassanelli. Good evening. Just going to wait a second until the presentation gets up. So good evening, President Viasquez, board members, and Superintendent Kern. Um, tonight, we share with you our ESSER 3 expenditure plan. For a little bit of background, school districts, county office of education, and charter schools 
that receive elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds under the American Rescue Plan Act, referred to as SIR three funds, they're required to develop a plan on how they will use these funds to, at minimum, address students' academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs, as well as the opportunity gaps that existed before and were exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So the purpose of this presentation tonight is to present the plan and talk a little bit about the interconnectedness to a plan that we presented to you back in the spring of last year, which was the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant Plan. So within this slide, there are um, some specific information pieces related to the SR3 funding. So for us in San Juan, this funding, we had about 115 million allocated to us. Um, the expectation is that the Board of Education hear the plan that has been developed in collaboration with input, in collaboration within our, our system and utilizing input with our um, community partners. And the deadline for that is October 29th of this month. And these funds are, can be utilized through September 30th, 2024. There are two pieces to the ESSER three expenditure plan. The first item, the first priority that it is outlined in the template is to implement prevention and mitigation strategies. And this is really to ensure that we are providing for continuous and safe operation of in-person learning. The second piece is to address the, acad the academic impact and specifically in the ESSER three requirements, it calls for a minimum of 20% of the funds that are needed to go towards addressing the academic impact of lost instructional time through the implementation of as evidence-based strategies. So in our plan, um, as we move through it, you'll see that a preponderance of the actions sit within addressing academic impact, really to about 88% um, of the funds that we received are going towards that specific area. So, Backing up in the spring of last school year, the district received expanded learning opportunities grant funds that was about $27 million. We um, conducted a lot of community input utilizing a thought exchange as well as listening sessions. And we developed a plan that not only utilized the 27 million that was allocated for um, the ELO plan, but we also wove together ESSER funds to create a multi-year plan that was um, comprehensive in scope and allowed us with multiple years of implementation, not knowing how long we will be navigating the pandemic and also not knowing how long um, we will be addressing the impacts of um, learning as we move through um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So this plan was approved by the Board of Education on May 25th. It provided for supplemental instruction and support strategies for targeted students. And um, like I said, it was a multi-year plan. We wove together the ELO funds as well as ESSER two and three and other funds that included title and supplemental. As a reminder, the ELO plan elements that we presented, they included several strategies. And so I just kind of want to give a little bit of a recap about what was in that content. So, one of the pieces was to expand summer before and after school and during programs. And you received a report um, just last month on the summer learning opportunities that we had. And that's an example of some of the actions that we were able to mobilize as a result of what we built into the ELO plan using ELO funds as well as ESSER. Additionally, you also received a board report back in August 10th that was really specific towards expanded learning opportunities at high schools and we featured Mira Loma High School. In that presentation, we talked about the importance of local control. So sites received um, additional funds to be able to utilizing a needs assessment, identify strategies for supporting students um, as they return to in-person learning. So pieces that they spoke about um, when they were inside the presentation was about the addition of a mental health therapist at Mariloma, an increased counselor, additional staffing specific to integrated math one, credit recovery, Japanese, English three, and physics. All of our schools are implementing strategies that are really in responsive to their community. So that's just an example of 
one implementation that occurred. Um, we also expanded our training for school staff on student academic and social emotional support strategies. Specifically, we launched um, a training at the beginning of the year that was focused for our instructional assistants as well as our, our bilingual instructional assistants. As a reminder, the targeted populations that were called out in ELO, they also map onto targeted populations that are expected within the ESSER three expenditure plan. So that includes disengaged students, English learners, foster youth, homeless, low income, students at risk of abuse, neglect, or exploitation, students who are behind grade level, and students with disabilities. So as a part of the our work in building our plan. So with the ELO plan, we already identified many, many actions as well as funds that we would be utilizing to support academic needs. There were still some funds in the ESSER three that had not been um, identified for specific use. So we conducted another round of a community engagement around those dollars. So we launched a thought exchange in August and it was at the end of August and um, that included close to 300 participants and several thoughts, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And then from that, we conducted listening sessions utilizing the input that we received in the thought exchange. Um, and we talked to various uh, groups. So let's talk about first the thought exchange themes. The thought exchange really focused on asking our community about changes or improvement related to our school buildings and how we provide services such as meals, cleaning, safety, and technology. Thinking back to that first priority that, I, that was on the, first, at the, on the second slide that called for how do we providing prevention and mitigation strategies to support continuous and, and safe learning. So the, some of the top themes, so the top one you can see is air quality, and that included ideas around upgraded filtration, HVAC systems, et cetera. Outdoor spaces was the second highest theme by StarScore, and that was included ideas of adding outdoor tables, uh, providing shade structures, really expanding those outdoor learning environments. Smaller class sizes or smaller classes was the third, and that was really to allow for greater staffing to have fewer students in the rooms. And then the fourth one that I want to highlight is um, cleaning and hygiene. And this really had to do with our cleaning and sanitation practices, as well as ensuring that we continue to supply masks, as well as hand sanitizer. So here are some groups. Here, here's a representation of the groups that we met with in September. So utilizing the thought exchange data, we met with these groups and we asked the following questions related to the data. We asked them, what theme areas from the thought exchange resonate with you and why? What is missing that should be considered to help or improve or maintain safe learning environments? And then what are your top five priority areas from questions one and two? And so from that, there were some key themes that um, came from the listening sessions. And I wanna call out that the column on the left that data came from this um, listening session that we just did this fall. The column on the right addressing the impact of lost instructional time, this represents the listening sessions that we did um, in the spring in preparation for the ELO plan. So it is a combination of two separate um, invitations for input. So I'm gonna focus, and, and you have this detail in your packet, it's on um, page five and six within the ESSER three expenditure plan. Um, but I want to really speak to spend more time on the left side of the column, um, because this is the new input that has not been presented to the board yet. So in terms of improving continuing mitigation strategies, this includes increasing the cleaning of classrooms as well as other environments at the schools, um, maintaining the sanitation and the sanitizing of tools, so, so such as like the spray, the sanitizer, the wipes, masks, et cetera. Um, increasing our COVID test testing availability and accessibility was inside of that. And also implementing activities that allow for safe in-person events. In terms of facility infrastructure, what we heard was the importance of outdoor learning spaces, 
um, and ask for installing more touchless water dispensers on our campuses. Again, I already spoke to the upgrade of air filtration, HVAC, and just really improving the airflow within our classrooms and upgrading facilities to allow for greater physical distancing. With the staffing shortage, so in, in terms of implementing strategies to address that shortage, um, folks really talked about our substitute shortage as well as um, our needs around recruitment and hiring. We ha we've had a lot of struggles in terms of that all districts do right now. And then the last piece, the key thing that we heard was around improving our COVID communication. And so that really has to do with the case rate, case rate notification, um, in general, our COVID notification protocols and exposure and quarantine notifications, the timelines that are associated with that in the process. So from those listening sessions, we identified some new strategies to support the continuous and safe in-person learning. And so the first action really is focused on providing um, safe and in-person learning activities and events. And so what we identified was $600,000 to help offset the associated student body accounts that have been negatively impacted by COVID to help fund events such as athletics, dances, and graduation. We also built in an action around improving facility infrastructure, and this includes expanding and adding outdoor learning spaces, as well as to install touchless water stations. And then the last item is supporting our bargaining agreements. This really speaks to trying to address the staffing shortages, uh, shortages that came up. And so examples of, of that include um, provisions that we have for emergency backup teachers, whereas where we pay teachers to um, work during their prep to help substitute in another classroom, or we have teachers on special assignment who forego the duties that they had that day as a teacher on special assignment, and then they um, help support a classroom by substitute teaching in the classroom. Another agreement that we have is around the, te the COVID testing coordination. And so inside of that is um, the provision of payment for uh, our staff to assist with the testing coordination that needs to happen at scale um, moving forward next week. And, and just to recap, so the, the total of this section for the strategies for continuous and safe in-person learning is just a little bit north of $13 million. In terms of addressing the impact of lost instructional time, um, these actions are not new actions. They're actions that you saw previously back in last spring as a part of the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant. The action descriptions are a little more um, scaled up in scope, and that's to allow us to be flexible and responsive as we continue to provide in-person learning while navigating the pandemic. So I, you can see the actions on the far left column, and then um, in the middle column are some specific examples. So I just wanna call out a few. So in terms of expanding summer programs, we did this through um, supporting Camp Winthers, as well as expanding Camp Invention and providing high interest programs at our middle schools um, during the summer. We also, in terms of providing before, during, and after school summer programs, you'll see that we provided for site allocation. So this goes into our belief around local autonomy and, and being responsive and constructing plans that meet the needs of the students at the school. And schools have been engaging in school partnership projects either during the summer by providing expanded summer programs. Or some are doing it right now during the school year. This could be through the provision of intramural sports. Um, expanding instructional supports in the classroom. A few examples here would be the teacher allocations that we provided that are above ratio. So this what specifically we provided a teacher at um, each school, an extra teacher in those schools either identified a specific content area that they were gonna teach to try to minimize the, um, the class size or also intervention teachers. We also expanded and added um, an instructional assistant in all of our TK through second grade classrooms. We expanded special education instructional aid hours um, to eight hours as well as our um, bilingual instructional assistant hours. So 
So measuring impact, this is a real layered responsibility that involves departments, programs, and sites levels. We are looking at qualitative and quantitative act, um, information. So specifically, we're looking at participation, academic, social, emotional progress, which you can see in the plan. We also are activating voice and empathy by keeping that close too, because um, the lived experiences of our students and our families also help shape our plans. We're supporting sites at the monitoring at the site level because the way that we built the allocations, there's a lot of unique activities that are happening at our schools. And so we have built in within our student system identifiers that help identify who's receiving intervention services, who's receiving um, social emotional services or tutoring services as a part of these funds so that we can follow the academic progress of those students or the social emotional progress of them. And then because this is a three-year plan, we are really focusing on continuous improvement and looking at this through a critical lens in terms of asking ourselves, um, where do we need to adapt? Where do we need to abandon? And ultimately, are there actions and services that we want to consider adopting and building into a more longer-term plan such as our LCAP? So our next steps, Currently right now, our ESSER three expenditure plan is posted on our district website. Um, we are, there's an open Google form so that the community can provide additional input. This is scheduled to come before the board for action on October 26th. Um, once the board takes action, we have a deadline to submit of October 29th. And then between November and December, the County Office of Education, they will review and approve the plan and then submit it to the California Department of Education. So with that, President Viasquez, I'd like to turn it to you for any questions and board discussion. Thank you, Ms. Bassanelli, for the report. We do not have any speaker cards or written comments on this item at this time. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues for questions and comments. We'll begin with Ms. Costa. Thank you for the report. Very detailed. I really appreciated it. And again, as with the K-8 report, the robust community input really has been very well done. And I'm grateful for that. I hope we continue along those lines throughout the year. With the challenges in hiring right now, can we change activities if money isn't spent? Yes, so um, there is flexibility for sites to um, adapt their plans based off of, it could be because they're not able to um, spend the money because of the staffing shortage, they can go back into their needs and then identify other actions and services that they wanna provide that they're more easily able to. And I was really grateful for the offset to losses of associated student body activities, funds. Um, and then all of a sudden, as you were presenting, this came up tonight for me. <clears throat> I've always thought of it in terms of high schools. Could the money be used for elementary and middle? Um, it's possible. We haven't yet really even talked about the way that it would be distributed. Um, but I don't, I don't see why not. I think the initial intention, though, is to support um, events such as the few dances that may occur as well as the athletics. And then the big question that we have right now is we're not sure what our state is gonna be, what our current situation is gonna be in terms of graduation when it comes down to graduation. So for example, graduation last year to do it safely um, and to do the streaming that we were doing, it was about $300,000 mm -hmm. for that activity district-wide. So not knowing what, we, what things may look like at that time, it's, it's kind of hard to say right now the way that um, the funds will be allocated. Ms. Costa, we, can, can I, so today I had an opportunity, I barged in on a meeting between Ms. Bassanelli and Ms. Schnepp, and they actually had the student body funds and they were looking at kind of a historical perspective over the years and current balances. And I think that's something that we'll continue to do because again, it's different per different sites. Some sites actually have some some balance is still there because they weren't able to spend them. And the fact that we did come in last year and support um, schools with graduation, 
But that is a big concern if we get to the end of the year again and they don't have funds um, and we've already kind of identified where these funds are gonna go, how would we pay for that, so. But we could use other funds, I mean, we could use these funds that were not spent in other ways, right? I mean, this is like what we talked about with hiring. Mm -hmm. It could, the plan could change. Correct. So we have the actions, we have the actions identified and if certain actions are costing more than others, then we can adjust um, our implementation in order to respond to the need that's occurring. And then one last question. We hired so many instructional assistants this year. I was really grateful to see that there would be training for instructional assistants. How often will that occur and how will it be made available? So it's um, currently it's on Zoom and we are implementing this training once a month. Okay, thank you so mm -hmm. very much. Great report. Thank you. Ms. Creason. Do you remember those movies, Three Men and a Baby? So when I was reading, this is three ushers and a Nilo. I couldn't <laughs> stop, get that out of my head. And I bring that up just because it's funny. And to say, you know, that's a whole lot of planning that had to happen in a really short amount of time with a lot of money and again, very diverse school sites. I mean, it's just a lot. So I just applaud all this while you were keeping kids safe and keeping campuses mm -hmm. open. It's just, it's wild. I mean, in the day job, um, you know, training for like apprenticeships in um, community colleges, you know, are really struggling to, you know, do it right and do it really fast because you have to. So I just want to recognize all of your work and I hope that rings in your head and it makes you giggle. Or yes, there's Thank an you. Email. Well, I have not thought of that movie in a really long time. So <laughs> <laughs> well, something to do this weekend, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so just a couple of thoughts. Um, the thought exchanges. So who, who was it just the um, folks that were identified on that slide invited to participate in this uh, thought exchange or was it a wide invitation? Great question. The thought exchange went to our entire system. Awesome. I love it. And again, just like I said, the last presentation, I know that it takes so much time and it's hard and but I'm glad that at least people had the opportunity to provide input. And I know things are moving so fast. So I appreciate the time that it took to do that. Um, I just wanted to touch on something that, you know, I understand and I agree that the response time is so important when exposure may happen and if there's an actual case and all that fun stuff. But in our house, we had um, a real dose of what that really looks like because it's not necessarily all the system on the system that the um, delays can happen. Because as a family and you have vaccinated people, you know, there's a time, you know, between when you think, oh, maybe I should get this kid tested. You know, there's a whole lot. And then you have to wait for the test if you didn't get it from the school, uh, the district. You know, it's not immediate mm -hmm. if you go to Cal Expo, let's say it's a couple of days. So I just want to point out, yeah, of course we want to do better. And so we could rapidly find out, you know, results and share the info. But I guess just for the community, I want to say too, there is um, a backlog that could happen at home <laughs> that you just don't really foresee, which is what we experienced recently. He's fine. Thank goodness he's fine. But it was an interesting thing to witness in real time. I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, if you didn't live it, you wouldn't know, right? Um, the outdoor space. So that's come up a whole lot and I'm glad that we're prioritizing that. When do you think the space would actually be available for use? Do we have an idea? I'm gonna have to defer to <laughs> Mr. Camarda. Hello, Mr. Camarda. <laughs> you, you know what, maybe that's even a question for the next one, but I will say like, when we have to go through the Department of State Architecture it's and submit thing. plans, it's months. Yeah. So, you know, my guess is that even it, it might be that some of these projects are planned during summer. Um, and I know he's got a different plan related to the water filling stations, which could be over like four or five months, but the outdoor structure space will look a little differently based on what we're required to provide. And I figured it would be a whole thing, but I had to ask, and it just makes, it makes me take pause because we know kids are eating outside now mm -hmm. and it probably will rain. It definitely will get cold um, at some point. So I'm just wondering what kind of stop gaps do we put in place? Because obviously we can't magically wave a wand and have outdoor space. So what can we do so kids are dry? And I think cold? some of the things that we can first start with is um, really digging in on a needs assessment in terms of what's needed at which schools. Some schools might have greater areas of need that we need to think about how can we be creative and attend to them while we're waiting for 
all the things I'm not going to pretend to know about in terms of construction. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but we can start by reaching out and really identifying, are there high need areas that we can provide short-term strategies while we build long-term plans around the outdoor spaces? Yep. I love that. And I think that's it. And again, just thank you. I know it's a whole lot really fast and you've done a great job. The whole team has done a great job. Thank you. Dr. McKibben. Um, first of all, thanks for talking to me this afternoon and clarifying some things related to your, how this connects to your earlier pr presentation. And one of the things that we were talking about was, was the whole notion of independent learners and so forth. And could you talk a little bit more about how that, how these things, what we're trying to do in, in this item helps us to meet those concerns that you uh, pointed out uh, in your presentation, what, about a month or so mm -hmm. ago related to uh, the people that we weren't, that weren't getting to or, or that we weren't as happy with the results related to uh, our students weren't quite as independent we discovered through the pandemic uh, mm -hmm. and so forth. So the actions identified in this plan, um, particularly the ones that are in the category of addressing the lost instructional time are actions that are inside the classroom that are to support students in their learning and also in building independence. So whether it's the addition of teachers to support reduced class size or also to support intervention um, or the use of instructional assistance, bilingual ins um, instructional assistance um, in special education, all of these strategies serve to support students and build and building their skills around what they're learning and how to learn. Um, so it's it's all interconnected, but it sits inside the classroom. In terms of this is a three year plan that, that you're laying out here. In terms of, for example, the what was it, 111 million or whatever, is, has some of that money already been spent? Some of it's encumbered and some of it's uh, set aside? Or uh, can you give me a, a breakdown of, for example, the $50 million related to instruction or the? So um, what you see, so I, I assume that you're referring to one of the specific items in the plan. Mm -hmm. So that is a total that will be spent over the three years and it's broken out by year. So like this year we have encumbered expenses. Some of it we've already spent. So such as my conversation around what we did in the summer. So the summer learning experience, were, they were expanded so much. We spent, um, we spent our full budget in the summer for that. Um, so right now we have, um, real expenses that are happening. We have encumbrances throughout the year. And then we have set-asides and that's for year two and three. And I think the thing that's important to note is that this is the best laid plan for this moment in time, not knowing how long we're gonna be navigating the pandemic, having to implement specific mitigation and prevention strategies. So while we've set aside the money in year two and three for specific actions, we might have to reassess based off of our state then and make some adjustments with the allocations that are connected to the actions. Okay. So stay tuned. Exactly. Um, I'll stop there. That's fine. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation and for piecing, piecing this together so well. I know it hasn't been easy, particularly under um, strict timelines. I appreciate that it's due on the 29th and we'll be taking action on the 26th. So excellent planning. Thank I you. call that excellent budgeting as well. <laughs> um, the one thing I wanted to kind of echo on the kind of outdoor learning spaces, I know that will take some time and I know that this is also a general description or example, but it does seem like it would be where possible a good opportunity as well to collaborate with our parks and some of their spaces. So I just wanted to make that comment and make that statement. I know I've, I've had some conversations with our local um, parks folks and it's not always manageable but you know where it is where we have close proximity of our sites to our parks it just seems like it's a really good opportunity to collaborate and it might be built in here already 10 million dollars is a lot of money but i just wanted to um 
state that. I also just really appreciate uh, the investment in both instructional assistance, but also just in our classified employees across the board. They're reflected here in multiple spots. Um, and I am very thankful for that. Um, and my last question, this one is actually a question um, <laughs> and it will might turn into a comment was just, I noticed in particular, there were two student groups that called out the lack of connectivity or the desire to improve connectivity. And that was our foster youth and our um, McKinney Vento or homeless students. And I didn't quite see that reflected um, in some of these really broad categories. So I was wondering if you could um, speak to that or if, see if there's room to kind of explore that more. I know that that's not a challenge unique to those populations, but they both um, signified it as a need and I'm wondering if there's an opportunity for us to meet that need. As a part of our foster youth work, we have uh, community workers that are already working with that population to address issues around those pieces. So I know that we've been ensuring that there's devices and connectivity. Um, that is something that I can follow up though, and we can give you more information if that's something that you would like to have more detail on. That would be great. Okay. We're still providing um, Peter, how many hotspots do we, are we have out there in our system? So, so we still have 3000 hotspots that are distributed. Um, and when we need more, so where, where it's identifiable in terms of those needs, we continue to provide those correct. So it, one of the things maybe that we could even go back to is, is do another check-in and where are we with connectivity with those groups? Um, because I, I, that's important to not even wait to see when we address that. So that course. would be great. And I think sometimes just the feedback loops aren't always there. So I just want to make sure folks know that it's an availability. I know that we have tried to fulfill that need. I know Peter, you've personally delivered many devices for which I am thankful. Um, but I just still have kind of an underlying concern that some of our student groups might not, whether they're foster youth, homeless youth or otherwise, or um, might not know that that's an available option. And it kind of clearly came up in a couple of spots that this is a challenge. So I would appreciate both um, a, a detailed update via BC or otherwise on where they were going or kind of where they've gone so far and what we might be able to do to kind of spread that word. Okay. Um, thank you. I think that's, um, let me do one quick run through. That's all I had at, um, at the top of mind. Um, thank you again very much for all of this incredible work. We appreciate it. This was a discussion item and it'll come back for action on October 26th. Next up, we are at item I3 and we have Mr. Camarda and Mr. Art. So joining us is, um, we'll give it just one brief moment to pull up the PowerPoint. Oh, I can get started before. Uh, and good evening, uh, Take President it away. Diazquez, uh, members of the board, wherever Superintendent Kern ran off to and uh, <laughs> Ms. Cunningham. Uh, it is always exciting to uh, come in front of the board and uh, share progress on our bond program. We have a very robust bond program. Uh, we're very thankful to our taxpayers for uh, having faith in us and seeing the wisdom in improving uh, San Juan schools. As you all know, our schools are, uh, are the majority of our schools are about 60 years old, so very much in need of improvement. Uh, so tonight I'm going to have Director uh, Nicholas uh, Arps come up. Uh, he's our Director of Facilities and Construction and Modernization and share some progress with you, what we've done in the past and uh, uh, what we have going on currently. Um, and then we'll be uh, available to answer any questions that the board might have. So, uh, Mr. Arps. Thank you, Mr. Carmarta. Uh, good evening, everyone. As stated earlier, I'm gonna give a brief update of where we've been, kind of a small roadmap for tonight, kind of a history and past projects, current projects, completed projects, future furniture, COVID and questions. First, I'll start off with master plans. This kind of gives an overview of what our facility master plan that we created back in 2014 encompassed. Most of it, I won't read through all the items, but you'll see most of the high school is signature projects, uh, expansion of the air conditioning for gymnasiums, outdoor spaces, middle school, K-8, elementary all have kind of similar classroom expansion and further items. 
So in our facilities process, we kind of have a four step process. First, we start out with our facilities master plan. We look at our sites. We go from there on what I was looking at back in 2014. Our next step is looking at enrollment projections. Um, as you remember, Ms. Camarda gave a presentation earlier about our enrollment demographics, where we're going. We like to review these because we want to be as most proactive as possible to make sure that we're doing the right improvements to the right schools at the right time for future students. Once we get past the enrollment projections, then we look at the site assessment. We kind of revisit the sites, make sure, you know, it's been seven years since we've done our master plan, make sure the assessments are still current, if there's been any changes. A lot of times we see some programs have changed throughout the years. Uh, we also look at work orders through the maintenance department and see what items have sprung up, been a problem reoccurring throughout the year so we can address those. And then finally, we look at the funding and construction. A lot of the funding is looking at state um, eligibility for state matching funds, our current cash flow in the bond, as well as staffing load. And then it rounds back up into the facilities master plan. And what we're currently looking at for the facilities master plan is converting it into more of a living, breathing document. We're looking at bringing it out of the 2014 stage into a digital living item to where we can continue to update it. That way um, our taxpayers, our staff, our community, can see what items we've completed, how much money we spent in certain sites, what items need to still be addressed, and kind of just leave a, a more of a running tab on where we're at currently to date for those. I want to run through a couple of our, our great projects in the past from 2015 to 2019, uh, Churchill, Sylvan, Dyer Kelly, Rio, and um, El Camino Performing Arts Center, we have Bella Vista Science, and then our track and field projects that we've been doing. Over the most current of 2020 and 2021, I wanted to leave 2020 in there because through the last two years, we've accomplished a lot under the constraints we've been working with. So we've opened up Greer Elementary fully. That was a multi-phase project. Uh, Mariloma Science Classroom. Castle Robla Fundamental High School Student Union, El Paso Manor Elementary full campus opening. El Campo High School Science Building, as well as their CTE program that, ho that hosts the fire academy, the broadcasting, computers, the fab lab. As well as Arden Middle School and Barrett Middle School, that's currently under construction. That one, when completed, will be a new multi purpose room with locker rooms, band, kitchen, uh, choir, as well as a science wing for six new science classrooms. And the entire campus itself will get a modernization, new drop off, pick up at that campus. And then, of course, we made sure that we, we held true to our promise to the charter school community. Um, over the years, we did we finished Little John site for California Montessori, as well as Winterstein site for Gateway, uh, doing modernizations at both those campus courtyards, new classrooms, casework, so forth. Of course, those are all of our big projects that we've been working on. There's also a bunch of littler projects that we have going on in the background. IT, we have upgrades to cameras, our wireless infrastructure intrusion. A lot of the infrastructure backbones for the district. Maintenance operations, we've been doing more of these, what we call light mods. And these are facilities that aren't in dire needs in our facilities master plans, but they just need a little bit of love and care. And so we go in, do new carpet, new paint, new furniture, and just really give it a nice refresher at those, those campuses. Uh, as well as Northridge play fields, and we're also doing district-wide HVAC controls, bringing our EMS systems up to date for better control for the maintenance department. As well as we've been doing HVAC at the high school gyms, uh, additional portables for expanding capacity, Catherine Johnson Middle School Administration, and of course, these glorious roofing projects, but we need to take care of our roofs for our students. You know, obviously we have a lot of other projects that we're currently in the works. We have for a look at elementary that we're working on, additional high school track and fields. Um, Catherine Johnson still in talks of what that campus is going to look like as we perform the the split at the campus at Encina. 
last part I want to touch on is furniture replacement. And this is one of those things that when we started looking at furniture replacement was part of those light mods. Um, as COVID kind of sprung up, our team um, spearheaded by Sheree Chenoweth has really kind of taken on a, a different form of what they've been doing. Um, during 2020, with the restrictions and the requirements, we had to purchase 5,000 student desks to fill multi-purpose rooms, uh, cafeterias, access areas that we would forecast where the students could be taught. As regulations continue to change, we ended up purchasing another 7,000 desks to go through and kind of meet the requirements for the three foot and six foot spacing that continually changed throughout the year. In doing that, it was a, a huge undertaking of working with maintenance to look at our inventory of the entire school district for each school site, which campuses need what. Every campus had almost different furniture at each site and making that work along with scheduling this throughout the summer during lockdowns. And then when we did come back, working around um, the school schedules. What it did accomplish is our full and completion, our reuse. So when we got to getting back into in-person learning, we took advantage of having new desks at all these campuses and reallocated them to a couple of different campuses and then supplemented doing full furniture at all the other sites or at that site. So that included new uh, chairs for the desk, uh, bookshelves, teacher desks, all the other supplemental items that go in the classroom, as well as looking at cafeteria tables and libraries. So we're able to complete, do a complete furniture update at a number of these campuses or they're in, still in the process. As well, as you can see the new desks on, for the COVID side of it, a large number of sites that got new desks and as funds become available, we'll come back through and update the rest of the furniture. And this is important for some of our other schools that aren't new construction. As you know, a lot of our new construction has, we've been doing teaching walls, has multiple shelf storage units in it. Some of our other school sites don't have those teaching walls. So we've been really evaluating different storage needs on that. Here's a quick picture of before, as you can see, most of our sites were mismatched furniture, different shapes, sizes. And once you kind of get it to a uniform classroom, it does make a big difference in there, especially when we're able to do carpet and paint in those classrooms. And of course, it's always fun to go into libraries. Libraries are the most fun because you get a little bit more freedom to use loud colors, make little pull-out spaces, and just get really creative with those areas. You know, I, I, before we get into questions, I did want to thank my staff. You know, the last two years, they've worked tremendously between my department, Sheree Chenoweth's department, maintenance operation, our construction management team partners, uh, Kitchell, ICS, Banner, KMM. You know, throughout the last two years, we did not have a break. We did not have a lockdown. We kept going to make sure that students had a place to come back to. So with that, any questions? Thank you very much for um, for the presentation and for the update. We do not have any speaker cards or written cards at this time, so I'll turn it over to my colleagues for any questions or comments, and we'll begin with Mr. Hernandez. Thank you. I just appreciate the report very much, and I uh, sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, I, I want to express my thanks to Frank and your staff because over the last two years, if, uh, you know, it's been very tough for us as a district, but one shining thing for us is that when, when we're dealing with all the things we're dealing with, there's a brand new school or two or three in our district. When a lot of the other districts were looking at us as, wow, how are they doing this? And I can't tell you how many times I've been contacted by the community just to be thankful of a new building in their neighborhood. And so it means a lot. It means a lot. It brought a ray of hope for our parents and our students, and especially those kids walking into a brand new school for the first time. I mean, it's for me is the greatest feeling to see these kids walking in their doors in brand new school for the first time. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. You guys have done an outstanding job and um, I'll leave my colleagues, but off the top of your head, um, Mr. Kamara, do you know what we have left in J and in P, our measures, as far as money? Do you have any idea? 
uh, J is fully spent and there's some residual funds there. That's where Sharia is pulling the funds from uh, to do furniture replacement. So very little left in measure N. Um, measure P, uh, we're gonna do a little uh, reallocation of funding. I think we're about 450 million right now. That's not, that's not including taking out um, a potentially an arcade modernization or new construction there and what Catherine Johnson Middle School's reaction would be. So about 450 million in balance right now uh, for Measure P. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Ms. Costa. I'd like to echo Mr. Hernandez's comments. I just was so impressed that the projects continued through the pandemic and really it is a shining moment to go by those new buildings and know that kids are in really good facilities and that we're continuing to work to make sure that every facility is the best that we can offer for our students. And then a second thank you. I was just amazed at the miracle of the furniture because I didn't think that we would in any way be able to get all of those desks to meet the requirements that for health standards and to get those, first of all, to be able to get them purchased and then to get them put together and then to get them delivered in time for kids to come back was just amazing. So a thank you to every member of your staff for really going above and beyond with the construction work with the furniture. You really made a difference, thanks. Ms. Creason. So of course, thanks, but I wanna point out something, you know, because of your work, when not shutting down, we were able to open campuses without your team doing what you did. We couldn't go back to campuses to meet the compliance and safety guidance and all those things. And so it's just, it's absolutely huge. So again, thank you, but I wanted to call that out for the record too. Without you, we would not be on campuses and we wouldn't be as safe as we are, staff and students. So thank you. Um, I do have a couple of questions. So on slide four, which I love the facilities process, can you share where the committee fits into this process? That usually falls under the site assessment. When we go back on step three, um, we go back in and evaluate the principal. We talk to the principal, we go back to the site. And then that's usually when we start pulling in some of the committees um, to look at what they, their needs have changed or if they've changed at all. Okay. Okay, um, master plan. So I know sometimes we have to adjust it. I mean, the master plan, it's the guiding light, but we can't always stick to it because other things bubble up is my understanding. So it's not linear all the time as much as we try to be. So can you walk us through a little bit, like how is that decision made when we have to go off track because something else takes precedence? Uh, it, did, it depends. Like Catherine Johnson Middle School is an example of that. I think Sylvan Middle School was an example of that. Uh, Catherine Johnson uh, with the... Uh, the community concerned about the 612 model uh, that that uh, that's taken us into a different direction. So we have to take a look at that. It's the board's purview, superintendent's purview to, to look at uh, uh, what program offerings that we can do or what or, or what we can do to uh, separate the two schools. So that takes precedence. So that has changed our um, order of uh, some of the priorities in the master plan. Uh, so we're reacting to that, reacting to the community. Uh, and also what the uh, what the board's uh, purview is as far as trying to find a solution to that. So that yeah, does I, take it out of order a tiny bit, but it's it's absolutely necessary, not only from the standpoint of the facility master plan, but also from the demographic shifts that were, were occurring. So we have to really take a strong look at demographics. That has really changed how our master plan priorities are implemented right now because of the major influxes of students that are coming in onto the West, uh, the West region. So that requires us to take a serious look at size of our school, capacity, location, all of those things that come in. We've had other things like class size reduction, uh, we've had program needs. So those types of things um, kind of uh, take us from one direction to another based on uh, the circumstances that we're dealing with at these particular times. Yeah, I think one of the other pieces is we purposely, when, when we went through the master plan, we graded sites, but we never put out a schedule of what was going to be done when. Uh, and we've seen that happen in other places. And then all of a sudden it's like, you told us we were getting this. We actually never did that. We, we stayed away from, and you know, we even heard at times you promised, nope, nope, we stayed away from that. We did a master plan. These are projects that we know we need to get done. I think it's even a roadmap. You know, Mr. Hernandez, as you talk about how much is left, okay, at what point 
down the road, do we look at another bond and the needs? Because this, this, what Frank and, and Nick and his team have done around rebuilding whole schools is, is going to serve this district so well for 60, 70 plus years. Um, and I think the piece you allude to about when we've seen growth in certain areas of the district and a priority really about serving our neediest communities first uh, really goes to the prioritization that the board has put on the direction for the district. Thank you for that. And the last thought that I'm going to throw out there is Arden is beautiful. I mean, all, all the new schools and all the buildings and the upgrades are absolutely beautiful. You have a bunch of really sad ninth graders that weren't able to access that <laughs> campus and all of a sudden saw their old school bulldozed down. And I, it was an amazing, the phone tree that happened, you know, once the kids started seeing that. So just throw it out there. Maybe we want to invite them back for a tour. Maybe only a fraction come, but um, they really were, they, they really went through it. It was a really a big heart thing that I didn't see coming for them. They were really sad. And I think it was, you know, emotions were really high because of pandemic period. Um, and, and then that happened. And you have a bunch of sad ninth graders. So you might want to reach out to them. <laughs> uh, I could only imagine. I mean, just uh, looking at where we've been with a campus that was built in the early 1900s to a, a modernized campus. I, I can see why they would be sad. Yeah. Yeah. No, but thank you yeah. for all that you do. I appreciate it. And I would uh, welcome any tour anytime. Awesome. Yeah. Dr. McKibben. Um, in terms of the number uh, of, of the signature projects, how many schools are, are left in terms of uh, uh, signature project? Uh, there's three, Mesa three. Verde, San Juan High School, and Encino. Okay. And, and in terms of the, re the, the replacement kinds of things, the kinds of things that you did at Thomas Kelly, which was furniture and it was floors and it was paint and those sort of things, what percentage of the, uh, of the schools have not had those kinds of replacement uh, things, can you guess? I don't think I can make a guess. There's, we have so much, so many little things going on all over the place. I can give you kind of our methodology and how we look at uh -huh. it. So there is our high need schools, right? So our, we look at our demographics, we look at the West End, we see where our growth. It just so happens that those are some of our oldest schools. So they're getting the most, uh, those are our priorities. Uh, where we are doing our refreshes are some of the schools like uh, Mr. Arps mentioned on the furniture replacement, those light mods, some of those schools that don't have those e exact high priority needs. They may not have these demographic shifts. Uh, they may be a C or a B. Uh, they won't have those. So they'll get those type of light mods like roofing, HVAC systems, furniture, carpet, paint. Um, I can't give you a percentage, but that's how we approach it. We have our high needs and then some schools that may not get full investments because they're still in pretty good shape. Uh, that's why as we work through our master plan um, and as we uh, continue to modernize, uh, we will get as far as we can go. And, and hopefully uh, in the next, um, let's say 2028, 30, as bonds start to fall off, uh, then we can go back to the public, show the progress, show where we've invested the money on our oldest schools. And I always like to use the phrase uh, that the school buildings tell their own stories and then the demographics assist with that. So as we start to go down the line of what our assessments are, of these school sites, some will get more than others. It's just the, the nature of the mm -hmm. of, of the assessment, the demographic, and the uh, and the overall need. Yeah, and it makes sense for the master plan to be a living document that the, yeah. that you continue to work on and improve. That make that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, my my last question relates to in in particularly in two thousand nineteen, uh, in in the presentations that you made to us, it appeared that we were on the cusp of probably being one of the greenest school districts in the state of California and that sort of thing. I have heard less about those kinds of things. And I remember you telling us that uh, some, some kinds of energy efficiencies and, and green things and that sort of thing pencil out and, and some of them don't. Uh, can you give uh, an update on the kinds of things that we've done related to energy efficiency and, and those sort of things uh, since uh, 2019. And also, uh, can you give me some kind of an idea of what has been the impact on energy costs for us uh, yeah. by, by some of the kinds of efficiencies that we've made? Yeah, I've, I've done board presentations in the past, Dr. McGibbon, showing that the, the projects we've done and the net effect on our operating expenses as far as the utilities, gas and electric, uh, but we have done projects um, 
we have sidelined a little bit of energy efficiency measures because of everything that's been going on. So we have taken a little bit of a stall, but we'll pick that back up. So type of projects we've done in the past, we've done LED lighting retrofit projects. So you, 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 you've been involved in those. All school sites went from our uh, fluorescent uh, to our LED lighting. So there's a net energy savings with that. We've done solar. Uh, we've done solar at Bella Vista, Mira Loma. Uh, we have solar compatible buildings. Every school building that's built right now has to have a solar compatibility. We have not put that on all of our buildings. Uh, we negotiated, as you know, a SMUD deal. 50% uh, of our power is built from, uh, is, is bought from uh, solar generated farms. Uh, so 50% of our power is being generated from, from uh, solar. Uh, so we have that, we have LED. Uh, we also have uh, our own solar. And uh, we will be doing energy efficiency upgrades with our HVAC systems, our energy management systems. So as you'll see in the next few years, our HVAC systems will become much more efficient. Our new schools are highly efficient, but our older schools will become more efficient with our HVAC replacements. Uh, so you'll see new roofing, new HVAC, and that'll have a net effect on our utility, uh, utility expenses. Um, oh, we're also, yes, thank you. Uh, we also have uh, uh, secured a grant for 10 electric buses. Uh, so we put, we'll be putting in the infrastructure to operate some electric buses. And as money becomes available, uh, we'll look and see if it, it makes sense for us to continue to, to uh, utilize electric buses. But uh, we've had a very robust uh, energy reduction uh, focus uh, the last eight years from now. We have seen the benefit of that. Um, and I can... Uh, Right now, we're not as energy efficient because we are really ramped up our outdoor air intake, uh, and that requires a lot of energy. So we have kind of sidelined that for safety and security purposes. So we're opening our dampers larger, we're bringing in more outside air, and that, like, like I said, it, it uses a little bit more energy. Once we get through this, uh, we'll go back to looking at our energy standards, benchmarking, and looking at other projects that can further reduce uh, our energy consumption. What we try to do is use restricted funding, uh, like bond funding, uh, any type of Prop 39 type funding that's over now, but use those funds, do the energy efficiency projects to reduce our general fund expenditures. That's been our process and our practice, and it's, it's worked out pretty well. Use that restricted fund to free up general fund dollars, and that's been our approach. Thank you. That all you have to do is look at the faces of the students, and you see, can see, you know, what what kinds of effects are construction and 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 even the the refurbishments I have made. So congratulations to you and your team. Thank you. Thank you very much for for the report um, on slide fourteen, where you have the classroom desks. Like for some reason, just in my mind, I keep replaying. Like you have not experienced pain uh, like the pain of kicking your shins on these old <laughs> desks in the crossbar and I'm just really glad that that's not being passed on to future student groups with the replacements of the desks or slamming your fingers in the old uh the ones that lift top, yeah. Uh, race top desk, yeah exactly <laughs> I'm not gonna hurt. Dr. McKibben laments the lack of ink wells, so I'm just gonna just so people know what he said to me, to me that prompted laughter. Um, I just want to thank you uh, for the report and thank you to staff as well. I know you two represent a very extensive team, some of who are here this evening, um, as well as our uh, very close construction partners. I see KMM and ICS here with us this evening. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, um, it's really great to uh, just see. I mean, it really is um, a silver lining of otherwise pretty difficult year. And it's pretty um, incredible to be able to drive through the community and be able to point directly to what we've been able to, to provide. And again, as you um, mentioned and appropriately acknowledged, Mr. Kamarda and Mr. Arps, this is what happens when the community has faith in us, right? And passes our bonds when we go out and ask for that money. And I have absolutely full confidence that um, most, if not all, would be impressed with what we've done and what we will continue to do with the funds. Um, and I won't get too political, but I do want to make the note that election night of 2016, there was a lot going on. <laughs> and I remember that evening very, very strongly. Um, 
this was one of the best parts of that evening. And if you had asked me five years ago, if this is what I had expected, I would have said absolutely not only because everyone has gone so far above and beyond. So I just really wanna offer a heartfelt thanks. I really, really appreciate it. And I know our students and our community do does as well. Um, I did have one question. Let me see if I can um, remember it before I got. You know, I just have to mention President Fiasco is that that bond really launched us into a transformation of, of San Juan schools and that continues on. It, it really has made a huge impact uh, on this district and I think it'll make a huge impact for many, many years to come. So yeah, so I, I appreciate you mentioning that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, can you speak a little bit? It's not like you've been working in some kind of special vacuum that hasn't been impacted by COVID. Can you talk a little bit about the supply chain challenges, what, how, what, how you've been experiencing that and how we might be experiencing that in the future? And I'll just note that our audience is chuckling. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah and, we, thought, we thought we were out of the woods once we got out of 2020. Um, but yes, the supply chain has been an ongoing thing. Every month, it seems to be something different. Uh, currently now, I was talking to the maintenance department, it's paint, they can't find paint. Um, just rudimentary little things. Um, we're seeing you know, possible labor shortage continue on some of the items, but a lot of it's shipping, you know, items that we thought were long lead times back in the day of six to eight weeks are now six to eight months. Um, so kind of to expand on the question about the shade structure for next year, we don't know, it, it depends. Um, with getting state approval and then getting in the supply chain to get our orders. If we were looking at six months just for shipping, it becomes very problematic. So pri prior, <laughs> as we, we continued along on our projects when COVID hit, we didn't have any supply chain issues. We were able to execute, get the schools open on time. We obviously had to put all the COVID you know, protocols into place, all of that, but we didn't experience any supply chain shortage, labor shortage at that time. It's now we're starting to see those shortages. We're starting to see labor shortages. Mr. Arps mentioned we have roofing, um, uh, roofing materials supply shortages. We have, uh, gosh, uh, all kinds of different things. We are trying to be creative in how we procure things in advance of a project so we don't run into these problems later on down the road. So we're, tr we're trying to be creative. Okay, when do we bring our materials in? Uh, how do we procure? How long are these lead times? How long, you know, uh, so, we're trying very hard not to have delays in our projects. We've been lucky uh, and we hope to continue to be lucky if things start to open back up and we start to get our supplies back on, back on track. I also hope that that luck ex continues to extend, but we're starting to see it really in a lot of the aspects of, of what we do from our nutritional services operations to our Chromebooks to now these. So I just think it's important to continue to discuss because it's something we have very minimal control over. And so if we start to see things slow down or some unexpected challenges pop up, I just wanna make sure that our community knows um, that we are at the mercy of the same global supply chain that's probably keeping up you know, any new appliances that they're ordering, et cetera. We are not immune to, to these challenges. So thank you. Yeah, and, the, and the cost related to those as well. So right. there's, there's uh, the, the escalated cost of goods and services too. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll be interested. I mean, we have our regular, this is kind of the annual construction update. I'm sure those will continue, but it'll be interesting to track what impact we have and kind of how that, I mean, thankfully it was a large bond, but I'm sure that our dollar will not be going as far as it had previously. So we'll be taking a look at that closely. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are now at item I-4. Early Literacy Support Block Grant Action Plan, Ms. Townsend. Good evening again, Board President Viasquez, members of the Board Superintendent Kern and Ms. Cunningham. Tonight, the superintendent is recommending that the board approve the Early Literacy Support Block Grant as included in attachments A and B. This plan was created by the Early Literacy Support Block Grant team, which was composed of school site staff at Dyer Kelly, including administration, the California Department of Education, the Consortium on Reading Excellence in Education, and the Sacramento County Office of Education. A root cause analysis was performed at the school site and it was determined that the students at Dyer Kelly needed support with decoding complex grade level texts by the end of third grade. You will also see that as a part of the plan, there are items that are noted as not a priority this is not indicating that it's not needed, 
but rather that these items are being addressed through other site funds, such as title funding and LCFF funds. And they were also found to be current areas of strength at the school site. So those are just items that won't be funded by this grant, but rather other items or other, other funding sources. This plan represents Dyer Kelly's action steps over the next three years. And the early literacy support block grant funding was approved by the board on January 26. The California Department of Education is now asking that we bring the literacy plan to the board as a business item for your action and approval of Dyer Kelly's literacy action plan, which is unique. Director Nicole Kukral is here with me tonight as the district liaison for Dyer Kelly and the grant. And the plan was well, very well thought out by the Dyer Kelly team who is here in the audience tonight. They're quite amazing. Have done a lot of work on this grant and we're thankful that they're here with us tonight. So board president Viasquez, with all of that, I pass it to you if any questions are needed or answers and questions are needed. Thank you very much. Cool. And um, we do not have speaker cards or written comments on this item. So I will turn it over to my colleagues for any questions on the item at this time. Seeing none, seeing none, Ms. Creason. Just a comment. Team, you are here for a really long time. So I just <laughs> want to acknowledge your presence. <laughs> it's wonderful to see all of you. And I know it takes a lot to build these plans and I always, and. Some, one of the many things I value about our district is that we really go, you know, deep with the school site to develop this. It's not, you know, just here in the ivory tower saying you shall. Um, so just appreciate just your, you and doing everything that you do for your kids, our kids. And thank you for your leadership as always. It's all of them. Well, thank you for your leadership as always. <laughs> and thanks for being here. Dr. McEvin. Just a couple of uh, quick questions. One relates to uh, uh, the literacy coach. Uh, I see that's a hire within the first year. Are we talking about a single person? Is it likely to come out of the staff or will, will it be one of the TOSAs? Or where do you expect that person to come from? Um, so in talking with the school, they've decided to receive coaching services and contract coach coaching services through CORE, which is the Consortium on Reading Excellence in Education. Um, in addition, our professional learning team will be supporting the school um, in the letters work. So with, there's coaching kind of classroom coaching coming from CORE and then also professional learning support from our district staff. The... Uh, the choice of, of Dyer Kelly, I assume, is because of uh, issues of scores and assessments, and 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 it's a state grant. And and uh, did you have to apply for this grant, or or was it offered to you? How how did? Can you give me a little history on how you got to where you are right now? Um, I, I believe that the grant was offered to the school, but I think I'd love to defer to the school for clarification on that. Thank you so much for having us tonight. Um, the grant was, was, there was an assessment done throughout the state based on law and procedures done before that. So we were sought out of, out of 25 schools. Um, the reason we were sought out is because of our low reading score, specifically in the third grade. I will say, um, as a whole, that can seem like a deficit, but for Dyer Kelly, we're a very unique school. Um, we have approximately 800 students of our student population. About 75% of them are multilingual. And of that 75%, we have many newcomers and immigrants to our country, as well as to our school. So this grant would help to supplement the teacher's development so we can better facilitate foundational instruction as to then use the curriculum provided by the district and the supports we already have to better facilitate now as well as in the future. So it builds a stronger foundation within our teacher team to support our students. I just want to add really quick too, um, that's important to note is that the data that we're talking about is summative data, but it, and it doesn't sit in a growth model. If you look at the dashboard, you can see the growth um, that is occurring at Dyer Kelly through their hard work. So I just, for the record, they have a lot of growth going on at the school site. So it's, it's not solely based on the one look. 
the one, the one little uh, uh, kind of picky thing was that when we talk, when you were talking about the literacy coach uh, training the teachers, I wanted to make sure that uh, that uh, as we increase the number of instructional aids and in fact to get parents back into school, that the literacy coach or somebody, some trainer or trainer's mouth gets to those people because they're going to be critical, I think, to this, to what you're trying to do uh, here. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so that's my one picky thing that that I saw that it didn't look like the training extended far enough, uh, and, and so forth. And I'm sure you you think about that, but I saw that in there. Other than that, uh, the only other thing is that I hope that uh, that, uh, and I suspect this will be true that uh, uh, what we're doing at Derek Kelly and this will become a pilot that will will spread to other schools across the district because that because it looks like this is a a, a really really good model, and. Uh, and don't forget to have the kids just read. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and thank you as well to the school site team hanging in with us at this late hour. Um, I know it's probably been a long day, but it's really great to see you and I appreciate that you're here. Yes, indeed. Um, the one thing, you know, it was kind of a, alluded to and directly spoken to in the presentation, but just for the purposes of public and general awareness, can someone just succinctly describe like most of our grants kind of come through on consent, et cetera. Um, who, where do the requirements that we formally adopt this come from and why is it kind of unique in that? Sense? So the formal requirement or request came from um, the California Department of Education. Um, and they actually specifically requested that it be a business item and that it could not go on consent. Hence us in front of you tonight <laughs> which just to be clear i don't thank have any you. objections thank so i just want to make thank you, thank folks you. <laughs> make sure everyone knows why this is just a little bit a little bit different a little, a little bit unique yeah um i don't see any further questions or comments at this time and so i have folks i see raised hands not for comments but to jump to okay all right that's what i thought i do have to still say the words so this is an action item is there a motion to approve the required elements of the 2020 2023 early literacy support block grant action plan so moved it's been moved by miss costa and seconded by dr mckibben all those in favor please indicate by saying aye aye, aye. that was unanimous thank you thank very you much, so much. <laughs> and congratulations. <laughs> we are now at item I-5, guest teacher salary schedule. Mr. Oropalo. Thank you, President Viasquez. Members of the board, Superintendent Curtis Cunningham. Superintendent is recommending that the board approve the proposed changes to the guest teacher salary schedule. I also would like to make two amendments to the schedule that you see in front of you. Um, and they read as follows, under the 250 for full day and 125 for a half day that they would also include a nurse and a long-term independent study in parentheses El Sereno. Um, those are two late ads as a, as a result of the item of feedback that we received both from um, our nursing services and from El Sereno. And I can answer any questions that you have about this action item. Thank you, Mr. Oropalo. Um, just do a quick check. We do not have any submitted or written comments on this item. Um, I'll turn it to my colleagues for any comments or questions. None, none, none. Okay. Um, I thank you very much for bringing this item. And so um, we'll be kind of considering it as proposed to, to be amended. So we'll be adding nurses and long term IS El Sereno um, to kind of the box here, right? Correct. This third row of our box. Okay. It is, this is an action item. Is there a motion to approve the proposed changes to the guest teacher's salary schedule as amended? It's been moved by Ms. Creason and seconded by Dr. McKibben. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was Thank unanimous. you very much. Thank you. We are now at item I-6, Williams complaint report. Ms. Simlick. Thank you and good evening, President Vasquez, board members, Superintendent Kern, Ms. Cunningham. Uh, as you're aware, education code requires that district staff report out at a regularly scheduled meeting uh, any William type complaints and the resolution of those complaints um, that have been filed with the district. 
I'm pleased to report that for the quarter of July through September 2021, there were no Williams complaints filed with the district. If you have any questions, I can answer them. Thank you, Ms. Simlick. We do not have any speaker cards or written comments on this item. Um, this is a report. Uh, do any of our of my colleagues have comments or questions on this item? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much thank for the you. report. We are now at um, item J, board reports. Mr. Hernandez. Very quickly on October the 6th, it was a national walk or ride your bike to school day. And I had the privilege of walking with students from Will Rogers to their school. And I appreciate the staff and the students that invited me. And I look forward to next year's walk to and ride to school day. Thank you. Ms. Costa. I had the opportunity along with several of my fellow board members to attend the San Juan Education Foundation Evening with the Stars, uh, which was by Zoom again this year. And it was wonderful to see people really contribute and um, make sure that our kids are funded. And then also Dr. McKibben and I attended the CSBA Region 6 delegate meeting. And I think for me, the most important thing was what Mr. Kern has been saying to us repeatedly of all of the issues that we're facing that we're not alone. And we certainly heard that several times over and actually many districts are having bigger problems than we are. So it felt good to hear that not only are we not alone, but we're in better shape than some. So thanks for that. And then uh, this week I attended CSBA's Governing Through Crisis or through chaos. And I really recommend that workshop if, it, if you're going to the um, conference in December and it's a session, it's worth going to and listening. The information was well done. If any of you would just like the handouts to it, I'd be happy to forward the handouts to you. But it was called Go Governing, Governing Through Chaos. Through chaos. And it talked about board meetings where things actually get out of control. It talked about how a board meeting is not a meeting of the public. It's rather a meeting to conduct the public's business and that we needed to be cognizant of that. And I actually wrote it down and I've thought about it a lot since I heard that said. And uh, I think it's, it was very useful information and something that in all the years that I've been going to see SBA presentations, it was new information. Thank you. Ms. Creason. I uh, wanna start with, I've been going on a lot of site visits. So I wanna thank the team that's been buddying with me to go and visit all the schools. It's just wonderful to see all the little kiddos back today. It was wonderful to go to Detterding and see the littles in their little dance class. Oh my goodness, just a wonderful thing to do, especially before a board meeting. Just a nice reminder of why we do everything that we do. One of the many reasons. Um, so I appreciate staff for making all that happen and being my buddy as we go and do that. Um, wanted to, thank everyone that has donated. Uh, as we've discussed at prior board meetings, we have a huge donation drive going on to support our new and returning Afghan neighbors. So appreciate everyone that's donated stuff, money, and then the volunteers that have showed up to help sort through everything and to support staff. There's a huge turnout. We have one of our volunteers in the office, uh, uh, in, in the audience. So thank you, Jen, <laughs> uh, for coming out and just offering your time. I mean, it's in the middle of the day and we have, you know, other responsibilities, but people just show up and step up how they can to support, you know, people that need us, you know, and it's just, it's really warming my heart. So just want to shout out to everyone that's given what you can and volunteering when you can. Um, it came to my attention that custo uh, custodian recognition day was either earlier this week or last week. Um, so that was new information to me. I was at a site visit and they had mentioned it. So I don't know if that was their own personal day <laughs> or it's a, 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 a 
an official day, but apparently they did a whole bunch of great stuff. So I have a note of that. So I just, I'm getting a look. So maybe it was wrong. Maybe that's something that they do at the school site level, but I just wanted to recognize our custodians, whether it was official day or not, um, and applaud the school site for really going out of their way to honor their custodians. I know I've been talking to Ms. Townsend a lot about what we can do just to show them that they're appreciated. I mean, their job, I mean, they do so much anyway, but, you know, especially in this time, you know, we have a bunch of kids eating outside and, you know, different shifts. I mean, it's just a lot more work, you know, and we want to keep them safe too and make sure they're feeling appreciated. So we had talked about, you know, can we just show up for um, after lunches and help clean up and, you know, maybe we can bring some donuts from or something. So I invite my fellow board members, maybe if you know, you want to do that too. Maybe we could all take on to the schools and just help clean up and just show our custodians that we care. That would be awesome. I think that's that's it for me this week. Dr. McGibbon? <laughs> he would like to align his comments with Ms. Creason's. Um, I will briefly add, um, on the 29th, I was able to join Superintendent Kern um, in participating in a community meeting um, hosted by Supervisor Desmond with the schools in the area, as well as our resettlement agencies to discuss kind of a lot of um, um, the, the needs and, and um, opportunities to serve our new neighbors um, and kind of some of the ongoing um, challenges created by federal law and state law and all kinds of kind of bureauc bureaucratic um, challenges that folks are running into. But ultimately, it was nice to be there as a show of support. Um, Twin Rivers was there as well. Um, but I'm grateful to Super uh, Supervisor Desmond for um, asking us to join him at that meeting. It was very well attended and I thought a um, good discussion. Congressman Bear's office was also there along with others. Um, I also got to participate in a um, CSBA interview uh, for an upcoming piece in their kind of publication around the services that um, we've been providing to our newcomer and English language learner populations. And just to be clear, all of the everything was described as what our team is doing. We are a team and um, got to really just brag about our staff. So that was fun. Um, and uh, I think that's all I really, oh, I was able to join the superintendent parent advisory committee and that was the first one. I, along with Dr. McKibben, um, joined the first in-person one for, I mean, I think the last one was January of 2020. So um, thanks to all those who attended both in person and on Zoom. Um, that is the conclusion of my board report. We are now at item K, future agenda items. Do any board members wish to add any items at this time to the future agenda? Seeing none. We are at item L, visitor comments. We do not have any in-person visitor comments, um, but I've closed the, it looks like we have one written submission. We do. Okay, so I will turn it to Ms. Rye to um, walk through our one written submission. Um, our one written comment is from Karen Vallon, who writes, as a doctor, I am urging this district not to follow suit with any mandates regarding vaccines in our kids. There have been 35 kids that have died from COVID this entire time in the state of California, 40 million people. Our kids do not need to have a vaccine mandate and doing so is total and complete overreach. And there's no further visitor comments at this time, and we do not need to return to closed session, so we are adjourned. Thank you very much.